Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Um, but just in case, I know some people uh, came in a little later than others. Um, if you haven't set up an environment already, um, the link with the instructions is right here, the GitHub. Uh, README has the instructions for setting up the environment. Uh, we're on Slack um, in the channel Reproducible DS. Um, feel free to post any questions or anything like that there. And um, we're going to be using a sticky system uh, so that uh, if you have any questions or are getting stuck uh, doing the exercises, uh, you can use the, the red or magenta sticky um, and put it on, on your laptop. And we'll be looking for those. Uh, and it will, we'll, we'll try to help you out if, if you um, are stuck anywhere. Um, also, of course, you can raise your hand. And if you're, making pro if, you're, if you're completed with the exercise already, then you can put the green sticky on there. Uh, and then we'll know um, that everyone's ready to move on. OK, so by my clock, it's uh, 1.30, and um, we, sh we can get started. I'm going to leave the doors open for the moment because of the temperature in here. Um, if it's too noisy or you have trouble understanding, let me know, and I'll, I'll do something about it. And hopefully, someone will be here soon to fix the temperature issue. Um, but yeah, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Chandrasekhar Ramakrishnan. I just go by Shekhar. I'm from the Swiss Data Science Center. Um, and I'm presenting here with my colleague, uh, Jufé, uh, who is from uh, Code Ocean. So we both um, work in places that develop solutions for reproducibility. And uh, we're working on trying to make it easier for data scientists to work in a reproducible manner. Um, our solutions are, are a little bit different. Uh, they certainly present themselves to the users differently. They integrate into the workflow of the user uh, differently. But um, they actually also share a lot in common, especially under the covers. And what we also share is a uh, conviction that uh, data scientists should really be paying a lot of attention to reproducibility um, and uh, would benefit from, from uh, working carefully and making sure that they're reproducible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, before we get started, it would be helpful, I think, for us to know a little bit about uh, the background of the audience here, um, because we do have a few different directions that we can take things in, depending on, on, um, on what your backgrounds are. So my first question is, how many people here are from industry versus academia? So if you're from industry or feel that you're, you know, consider yourself as being from industry, can you please raise your hand? Oh, OK, right. That's the majority for sure. And from academia? OK, right, yeah, significant portion, but um, all right. And um, in terms of what you do, um, how many are consider themselves data scientists? OK, and software engineers? OK, and data engineer or something? OK, and other? Is there other? <laughs> what, what, what's, what's other? Uh, like OK. OK. Right, right. I see. And so you? Uh, I work for a consulting firm. We do like a broad range of analytics in the consumer lending space. So kind of like a breadth, not depth thing right now. But OK. I'm to learn more and go deeper on some specific topics. OK, I see. Right. Hi. I'm Maddie. Oh, OK, great. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, I see. Right. Um, and uh, let me see here. What are some other things I wanted to ask? Yeah, and so um, how many of you feel like you already are working reproducibly or trying to do so or are supporting your colleagues in working reproducibly? Oh, OK, yeah, that's great. And how many, um, d does anyone think it doesn't matter to work reproducibly and what needs to be convinced? Or I'm assuming if you're here, you're already <laughs> Kind of, all right, um, part of the choir. OK, that's good. Uh, and have, have any of you tried to reproduce things and, not, and, and failed at doing so? Yeah, could I maybe hear a couple of like anecdotes about what, what happened when you tried to, to reproduce something? OK, so um, my PhD is in machine learning, and I got it back in the 90s, where uh, all you really had were papers to read. And um, there were usually about 10% of the papers where there was enough information in them to actually get the, the uh, to reproduce the 
results. Because a lot of science, you have to start from a known place in order to go somewhere for comparative purposes. And it's always been a frustrating thing. I think it's getting easier now. But um, I, I want to help scientists do that. I want to write okay. software that helps them do that. Right, I see. Um, and anyone else who's tried and failed? I had a, for my master's thesis, I submitted it to a journal and got a revised and resubmit. And by the time I got that, I wasn't at the institution anymore. And I tried to recreate my analyses um, for their requests, and I couldn't do it, and I didn't have the same software. So I had to collect new data to resubmit the thing again. So. Oh, OK, right. And is there anything that you could have done like in retrospect, that would have made it possible, or yeah, I, I mean, I could have used um, open source tools in the first place. Oh right, okay. That got me really thinking. I mean, if, if I can't reproduce my own results, certainly no one else could. Right. <laughs> that's yeah, and actually, that's a key, um, I think, aspect of reproducibility. Uh, that the um, your, your audience is often yourself, just later. <laughs> Okay, so, um, all right, let's see if we can go through these slides. Okay, okay. Um, so yeah, it, it sounds like nobody here needs convincing uh, that reproducibility is important, which is good um, and expected, otherwise you probably wouldn't be here. Uh, but you might have colleagues uh, that do need convincing. And so I want to start off by discussing some concepts uh, and things, first of all, so that we're all um, terminology-wise on the same page. Um, and uh, second of all, so that you have ammunition, uh, so that when you talk to your colleagues, you can convince them that reproducibility is something that they should be paying attention to. Um, so we're going to start off with the conceptual kind of framework. Um, then we're going to move on to like a survey of tools, um, both low level and high level. The lower level tools are, uh, some of them are at least not really intended for you to interact with directly if you're a data scientist. Uh, if you're a data engineer, then maybe yes. Um, but it's still good to know that they're out there. So I just want to just show you a few tools, show what they, show what they do, uh, in what situations they can be used, um, so that you'll have seen them. And if you later uh, need to refer back to that, you'll know where to go to find more information. And then we're going to spend the majority of the time uh, doing hands-on um, with the two solutions that we develop. Uh, uh, Renku is the solution that I work on, and uh, CodeOcean is the solution that uh, Jufei works on. And by all means, please, um, this sounds like it's like a super diverse group. So if I say something that doesn't make any sense or you don't know what I'm talking about, um, please feel free to ask questions and interrupt me whenever. Um, I'd, rather you, I'd rather be interrupted than have people not, not know what I'm talking about. Because if you don't understand something, then somebody else probably doesn't as well. OK, so um, let's first start a little bit uh, with the philosophy and theory of reproducibility in data science. So. Um, Reproducibility has long been expected from uh, data science, but people realized that a lot of research and work wasn't actually reproducible, and this kind of created a so-called reproducibility crisis. Um, and uh, as a result, it's kind of led to a demand for more people paying attention to reproducibility. But what do we mean by reproducible? So let's first kind of... Um, uh, sync on terminology, and uh, Lorena Barba is actually here, <laughs> so uh, she can correct me if I'm wrong uh, <laughs> with my use of terminology and any of this stuff. So um, maybe I can ask a question. Do any of you distinguish in meaning between reproducible and replicable? Does, do those mean different things to you, or do they mean essentially equivalent things to you, or equ equivalent? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's that's, that's more, more or less what I expected. Um, so there are kind of two different meanings of, of reproducibility that it's worth uh, distinguishing from one another. Um, and I'm going to call the first one direct reproducibility. So direct reproducibility is where uh, a, a data scientist has an idea, gathers some data, 
um, and writes some software to analyze that data and does an analysis. And then a second data scientist comes and is interested in, in exploring this idea and um, copies the data from the first data scientist, copies the software from the first data scientist, and uh, runs the analysis uh, themselves. And if those results are equivalent, then we say that, that a research is direct, uh, directly reproducible. And um, I want to distinguish this from the concept of conceptual reproducibility, where um, the second data scientist takes the idea uh, of the first data scientist and writes their own software, collects their own data, and does an analysis. Um, and if those results are equivalent, then we say it's conceptually reproducible. You can take the idea and recreate that and uh, get an equivalent result. Um, some People distinct, use the terms reproducible for direct reproducibility and replicable for what's, uh, what I'm calling conceptual reproducibility, but it's super confusing. Um, so I'm just going to use that designation, uh, either direct or conceptual, to uh, distinguish between them. If I just say reproducibility, I'm talking about all of the meanings of reproducibility. It doesn't really matter. And if I want to highlight one definition or, or another, then I will uh, use that adjective to clarify. So um, why do we care about reproducibility? Again, I know uh, you guys are all convinced that it's important, um, but uh, I want to just kind of put this out there because we're going to refer to it a little bit later uh, when we look at solutions for reproducibility and what aspects of um, the spectrum of reproducibility they support. So uh, philosophers of science have identified several important functions that reproducibility serves. Um, it makes it possible to detect fraud it makes it possible to find errors or artifacts uh, in data science, and it makes it possible to verify and generalize hypotheses. So the first one for me is not super important. Um, I don't think there's that much fraud out there. Uh, when it happens, it's very spectacular. It gets a lot of attention. Uh, but I think that's more the exception than the rule. But errors and artifacts are, of course, very commonplace. And um, knowing that, that you've, you've made an error uh, is very helpful. And doing work in a reproducible way makes that possible. Same for artifacts uh, that might be a consequence of the way data was collected or some choices that were made in the process of analyzing it. Um, and by working reproducibly, it's possible to find, find these things and uh, fix them uh, before they cause any problems. And of course, beyond that, reproducibility has a lot of fringe benefits. It makes it possible to reuse data and code, and it makes it possible to share and extend results, which means that you can work more efficiently and uh, don't have to end up reinventing the wheel when you can just borrow one uh, that already exists. But so that's all well and good. That's all kind of the theoretical justification for reproducibility. But for me personally, the reason it's, um, I think it's important is because you might be asked to rerun an analysis that you did six months ago, as uh, one of the participants just pointed out, right? And if you work reproducibly, it'll take you a few minutes, hopefully, uh, to do this. Maybe there'll be some computation time involved, but you can just kind of uh, click a button and then wait for the results. And if you don't work reproducibly, it can take days, if you're lucky, maybe even longer, um, to reproduce research. And that's uh, kind of a waste of time. So um, that's why I personally think reproducibility is so important, because it really benefits, benefits you yourself. Um, right, so I'm, I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker because, like I said, this audience doesn't need convincing. Uh, but as we all know, there's a lot of work that's not reproducible. And the reason people say is they, they're not focused on reproducibility is because, well, it definitely, it undeniably takes some effort up front to work reproducibly. Um, and for whatever reason, people find that that effort is not justifiable because maybe they don't have time, or maybe it's more effort than they feel uh, necessary in that process, or maybe because they feel it's not valued. Um, and uh, one aspect of reproducibility is that you need to be able to share data and code so that uh, other people can take advantage of it. And um, a complaint is that, well, if I do that, then nobody credits me. I don't get any benefit from doing that. I don't, can't advance in my career. Um, and fortunately, tools are being developed to rectify these problems. Um, as a result of yeah, uh, events that have happened in the last few years, there's a lot more focus on really supporting reproducibility. And uh, these tools address um, exactly these concerns. So uh, there's tools that make it much less 
effort to work reproducibly, and there's tools that can, for example, make it possible to identify and acknowledge contributions uh, made by people so that if you do share data or you do share code, um, that gets valued and you gets acknowledged and you can see that uh, that, that was uh, a contribution to the final result. Um, but uh, Nonetheless, I mean, for me, again, I think the main reason that um, you want to dedicate some effort to working reproducibly is that it pays dividends, um, and these come very, very soon. Uh, it's just more efficient to work reproducibly, and it allows you to work more, effective, more effectively, and um, you yourself, in the end, will probably be the biggest beneficiary of working reproducibly, even though there's all these other reasons to also work reproducibly. Um, there's... Questions on that, uh, feel free to ask. And if not, we're going to take a look at some kind of technical solutions to, to uh, reproducibility. OK, let's see. Uh, all right. Oh, why does it always do this? <laughs> OK. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to start by talking about kind of um, building blocks that are used to build solutions um, that are designed to be used by data scientists to work reproducibly. Um, so uh, solutions that, that offer reproducibility um, aim to provide a few some subset of, of these features, maybe all of them or maybe just some of them. So um, the first thing is that the, the tool aims to allow others to recreate analysis that was done. Um, some try to help others understand how a result was derived. And uh, another feature that, that might be supported is to make it possible for, for people to extend results. I can, sure. Uh, yes, sorry. OK, yeah. Is that better? Can, can everyone read this? Yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for, for letting me know about that. Um, and in order to provide these features, um, these tools make it possible to answer five questions. And these five questions are, what environment does the code run in? Is it smaller? Uh, Right. What, what environment does the code run in? Um, how are programs and data connected together to arrive at the final result? How did the code and data evolve so that it um, came to its present state? Uh, and what does the code do, in fact, at all? And finally, where, where can I get the code and data? So. Um, this is all information that, that, at some level, people need to provide. So you do need to put a little bit of effort, for example, into documenting what environment um, you use. Uh, but tools can help by making it, if you, um, for example, with, for the environment, if you document the environment in a format that's machine readable, uh, then the machine can actually recreate that environment for you. So you don't have to, you can, of course, describe it in prose. Um, but then somebody has to actually carry out those instructions, whereas if the, uh, the environment's described in a machine-readable format, um, the tool can automatically construct that environment for you. Um, so let's, let's take a look at, at, uh, at these questions. So um, the question, what environment uh, does the code run in? If I'm working in pure Python, I'm, actually, is it, it's, is it safe to, does everyone here no Python <laughs> to, to, to some level? OK, right. I mean, you may also work in R or MATLAB or something like that, I presume. Um, and the way you answer these questions is a little bit different in those environments. But uh, let's, let's stick to Python for the moment. So if I'm writing, if I've written some, some pure Python code, maybe let's say I've used um, the scikit-learn library, um, how do I describe the environment that my code runs in? Anyone, anyone have an answer? I could, there's at least three or four answers that are probably pretty widespread. Requirements.txt, great, yeah. That's, one, that's certainly one way of doing it, where you say scikit-learn is one of your dependencies. Um, I think there's a couple of others that, I don't know, um, so 
pipenv is a, is a new kind of alternative to pip, uh, which it can also import uh, dependencies from requirements.txt, but it has its own format called uh, pip file as well um, that has some advantages. So this is, a, this is a newer tool. I think it just kind of started becoming used about a year ago, um, but that's another way of, of describing a pure Python environment. Um, and then uh, Conda uh, is uh, another way of, of describing a, a, uh, a, it can describe more than pure Python environments, but it's certainly capable of describing a Python environment. And it can read the requirements.txt format, um, and it can also handle its own format called environment.yaml. So, okay, so the Python part we've kind of got under control, but um, what if I have um, some software that I've written that depends on things that are not in Python, that are elsewhere in the environment, for example, a command line tool, um, how would I describe the environment for, uh, for, for making that reproducible? Containerize it? Containerize it, yes, that would, that would work. Um, uh, that's, that's certainly, yeah, that's, that's a good solution. Uh, any, um, any, can you think of maybe a lighter weight solution, though? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, it's a leading question, but uh, <laughs> it's okay. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, so I think I, I have three kind of solutions here listed in terms of increasing, I guess, complexity of use. So um, Conda is, I think, widely known, at least among the people in this room, um, as a tool that you can use to, to manage dependencies. And it can do Python dependencies, but it can actually also handle um, dependencies that are command line tools. Um, but it also leaves quite a bit um, up to the, to the environment in which Conda is installed. So for example, you can't control the operating system uh, on which your program runs if you're working uh, with Conda. It's on whatever operating system uh, that uh, tool is installed in. Uh, with a containerization uh, solution, as was uh, suggested there, uh, you can you can you can of course also um, require that certain tools are available, um, and you can also pin down other dependencies. You can say exactly what operating system you want. You can even say that you want a particular version or something like that, and make it possible to really uh, very very uh, concretely pin down what environment you want your uh, software to run in. So Docker is a very widely used uh, tool for containerization. Are people familiar with Docker? If you've, if you've heard it, raise your hand. Oh, OK, yeah, that's almost everyone. And if, you, if you've used it, can you raise your hand? OK, yeah, that's, all right, makes sense. Uh, that's um, a subset of those people, but still pretty uh, numerous. Right, and then there's another containerization tool that some of you might be uh, familiar with if you come from high performance computing that's called Singularity. It's conceptually very similar to Docker. It has a few uh, differences that make it a little bit more amenable to certain environments. Um, and as a result, it's more popular in those environments. Okay, so let's do a few exercises together where we're going to specify environments to run some programs. Okay, so how would you specify an environment for this program? Yeah. That's right. That's probably, I mean, certainly, yeah, probably what I do. I just tell the user, look, here's a program, just you need a Python 3 or maybe 2.7 would actually probably work as well, environment, and leave it at that. Um, you can, of course, write a Docker file and you know make that a little bit more explicit. But I would say for this one, it's perfectly adequate to just use prose and say, yeah, you need a Python three environment and leave it at that. Okay. Another example. Can I execute that? Oh yeah, it ran. Um, how would you specify an environment for this program? And yeah, how would you how would you do that? How would you specify that dependency? Oh, like that? Yeah, um, that's uh, that's that's kind of how you bring the dependency into the program that you're executing. But it's it's not just I guess you, the person would have to read the program to see that matplotlib would have to be in the environment, unless I m misunderstood you. Like, can you? Is there a way that you could kind of force the environment to include matplotlib? Or 
environment yeah it, exactly i don't know if that's what you also um meant is that is that clear why the the distinction between those two Oh, sorry. Yeah, the solution was to use um, requirements.txt or environment.yaml um, because just by by importing it into your program, it's not actually guaranteed to actually be in the environment. So if you executed this program in an environment where matplotlib was not available, it would complain that matplotlib is not available and wouldn't run. So um, you'd have to. Uh, tell the user to first pip install the requirements.txt file um, so that matplotlib is in the environment. Um, any questions on that? Is that clear? I'm sure you're going to get to this too, but you have to kind of know which version in general you're using. So that's also where those files come in handy to specify the version. Right, exactly. So um, if I just declare matplotlib is a... Uh, um, as, a, as a requirement, then this program will, will probably run, but it might print out like differently, right? Because they might have changed some of the, the, the styling, the default styling, and I don't apply any styling explicitly. And if I really, really want it to be exactly the same, I would need to specify the version of matplotlib that I'm using. Yes, that's true. Uh, we'll, we'll look at that in the hands-on part. Right. Okay, so... For those of you who are not familiar with it, curl is a command line tool that makes it possible to interact um, with uh, HTTP servers, so like web, like web servers or anything else that communicates over HTTP. So let me execute this program. Um, so how would I declare an environment um, where this program would be reproducible? Yeah, exactly. So um, for this one, uh, requirements.txt is not going to be sufficient because curl is not a Python tool. Um, so I need to be able to specify external dependencies. Um, so the, the solution was to use um, either uh, uh, the conda environment.yaml file or, or Docker. And either of those will work, because conda does have a package for curl. Um, and uh, with Docker, you can just declare what OS you want and uh, install the, the curl package into that, into that OS. So either of those would work. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, and this one um, is here just more as an example. This is a case where, where Conda is not going to be sufficient uh, because uh, this per apt is a a uh, package manager that's only available on particular Linux distributions, so you need to be able to pin down um, exactly what operating system this program runs on. So you'd have to use something like a containerization technology if you wanted to make this reproducible. Okay, so the second question that we need to answer is how are programs and data connected in order to arrive at the final result? Um, there's a couple of common ways of, of, of uh, building these workflows. Um, so one is with scripts, like a bash script, for example, where um, you specify exactly what needs to be executed and in what order um, in order to get to the final result. Uh, another way of doing it is using a workflow manager. Um, they both have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, scripts are very succinct. And the uh, languages are, are pretty widely known, like Bash is a language that a lot of people know. Um, but they have a disadvantage as well, which is that the steps are declared or defined in an imperative way, which means you say exactly what you want done. And that makes it harder to introspect on what's actually happening in the script. Um, workflow tools usually use a declarative format where they don't say what needs to be executed. Um, alone, they just say that this needs to be done. So the, the distinction is subtle, but because um, of defining the workflow in a declarative format, it's possible for tools to introspect and see exactly uh, what's happening in the workflow. And it's also possible to do things like, oh, bless you, to, like it's also possible to execute a workflow in different environments. So 
um, a workflow manager can uh, execute a workflow um, on, on a single core processor. It can also maybe um, adapt and realize that there's multiple cores there and run things in parallel if it knows that certain tasks are parallelizable, or, or it can run things on high-performance computing infrastructure scheduling jobs. And this is much harder to do in a bash script. Um, where you'd have to do a lot of coding to kind of detect the environment and figure out how you want to run. Um, and then there's another aspect of how the result is computed, uh, which goes under the term provenance. So the workflow defines what needs to be done to arrive at the result. The provenance contains a lot of metadata about how that result was derived and how each of those steps were executed. So provenance information might include who ran the step, um, where the data came from, who the author of the data was, and so on. And um, not all tools support provenance. Uh, it's not like an absolute requirement for reproducibility. But ones that do make it possible to answer some questions um, that can be helpful for reproducing research. Like if you. Um, see that a, a particular step in a workflow is executed, and you see who did it, you can go ask that person, well, why did you do this? Or why did you choose these parameters? Or something like that, um, which uh, can be helpful in reproducing results. And beyond that, if you want to answer some of those questions um, about who contributed to this result, um, then provenance information can be helpful for doing that as well, where you can see the data came from uh, this one person, the code came from this other person, and the uh, third person put it all together and, and uh, computed the analysis and uh, make it possible for everyone to get credit for their contribution. Um, okay, so the third question we need to answer is how did the code and data evolve? Any, any um, ideas on how we can solve this problem? How can we capture how code and data evolved? Version control. Version control, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, use version control. Um, do How many people here are familiar with Git? OK, that's very, very good. <laughs> that's basically everyone. Does anyone use Mercurial or anything else? OK, a couple of people. All right. Um, great, yeah. So. The best way to uh, figure out how code and data evolved is to use version control. Um, so uh, you probably know this already, but Git is, is great for text files, especially kind of small text, the uh, code, um, some database formats that are text uh, based like CSV or JSON, also fine to put in Git. Uh, Git doesn't do a great job at dealing with large data or with binary data. Um, but fortunately, there are solutions for those problems. There's uh, one tool called Git Annex, um, and there's another one called Git LFS that both extend Git and make it possible for to track within a repository uh, binary or large data artifacts together with the code. Does anyone use either Git LFS or Git Annex? OK, uh, just a couple of people. Uh, but have you heard, how many of you have heard of them? A few more. OK, right, I see. OK. So um, all right, version control seems to be a done deal here, which is great. Everyone's using it or um, knows about it, at least. Um, the next question that we need to answer when uh, working for reproducibility is the question of what does this code do? Um, and here's the place where tools have the kind of smallest role to play, because people really need to provide this information. Um, how, do you, how, how, do, how do you all work in a way that your code is understandable? Are there any guidelines or, or like goals that you strive for when writing your code? OK, yeah, great. Documentation and testing are definitely um, ways to ensure that code is understandable. Right. Yeah, I'm glad to hear testing there, because that's something that a lot of people overlook. I'm sorry, could you say that again? I fail all my students in the university course unless they use Pepe. Oh, OK. <laughs> so you fail your students unless they, <laughs> right, OK, that's very good. <laughs> that's kind of a very stick approach, but <laughs> that's, that's good. Um, yeah. So uh, this is 
as I said, kind of the place where tools have the, have the smallest role to play, um, you really need to kind of teach people to write code in a way that's understandable. Uh, documentation can help. Um, and there's guidelines that go under the name of clean code or literate programming uh, that also um, uh, identify ways in which software can be written in a way that it can be understood. Tools do play a small role in that you can use tools like linters or formatters um, that make it possible to automatically detect uh, deviation from standards because there are there are times in which um, you look at code and you see the like syntactic differences that are not actually important for the meaning of the code, but it kind of uh, distracts you from understanding what's really there. And using tools like linters and formatters can, can enforce some consistency there, um, but that's more kind of at the team level, not, not so much globally. Um, furthermore, yeah, writing tests, be they unit tests or integration tests, can be very, very helpful for understanding what code is supposed to do, where you specify that when you execute some code with this input, that this output is what should be produced. So um, that's another way of, of kind of documenting code and ensuring that it's understandable and has the benefit um, that you can, uh, you can develop more effectively because you can automatically test that. Yeah, there's a question back there. Right. And you can download both your data and your code simultaneously. And I guess my, my issue is, is, is understanding more about where to put your data so it's easily accessible for everyone and keep track of the provenance of your data. OK, yeah. So the question um, for those of you that didn't hear is, uh, I mentioned using Git to, to manage uh, code, and I, I said something about it to use man to, to manage data as well, but I didn't exactly clarify how that should be done. And um, that's something that we're going to take a look at. So here's, I think, where there, there's a variety of answers at some level. There isn't yet kind of standardization on, on one way uh, of doing this. And different tools take different approaches to doing that. We're going to look at um, the tool that I'm going to show. Renku does do that. It uses uh, Git LFS to, to manage data. And it integrally kind of manages the data with the code as you work. Um, as a side effect of the commands that you execute in Renku. Uh, but there is, I think, probably room for several different answers to that. Um, and maybe we can, we can talk about that in a little bit more detail, uh, like in the break or something. Um, Another thing that's very helpful is to um, have a README for your project, right? It's not mind-blowingly innovative, but it's super useful. Um, and it's become much more standard to do to tools like GitHub that automatically show that, uh, that people start writing some brief documentation that explains what the project's about. Um, if it's a data science, maybe where the data comes from and what um, algorithms or approaches are used for analyzing the data. And furthermore, using a standardized Project structure can also be very helpful for communicating meaning um, within your project. So uh, this is kind of one that I recommend where uh, you, um, any question that you have about, well, where do I find this kind of information in the project uh, is pretty intuitively answered by looking at the names of the folders. So if you're looking for where's the data in the project, you see there's a folder called data. It's an obvious place to put the data. Um, if you work with Jupyter Notebooks and uh, you're looking for where are the notebooks, you put them in the notebooks folder. Um, the one little embellishment that I recommend is um, putting source code in the source folder, SRC. Um, but I tend to already break it down by programming language. So I have one folder for Python. That's a subfolder of the source folder, one folder for R, and so on and so forth. And even if I start my projects as like a pure Python project or something, I tend to use this structure anyway, um, just because I often find that my programs um, extend into other languages. Like I might start thinking that it's just going to be Python, and then suddenly I need to use some Bash or something like that as well. Um, and then I have it's it's very trivial to extend the structure to support that. Whereas if you have everything just in the source folder, uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult to support a, a second language. You have to do a bit more work. Um, and there's a great tool uh, called uh, Cookie Cutter Data Science, which is a template uh, that's a cookie cutter template that spits out a um, standardized project structure for data science. Uh, and if you're not familiar with that, I definitely um, can advise. Like in the notes, you can click to a, a link and uh, learn more about it. Uh, that's also a great solution for um, ensuring that your projects use a standardized structure. All right, some exercises. 
So I'm going to show you this program uh, by uh, Ben Kortovich. Um, and it's reproducible in the sense that if I, I told you what the answer was, um, you could run it and see that it does produce that answer. Um, and so in that way, it's directly reproducible. But it's pretty far from conceptually reproducible. So let me see here. Uh, Wow, it's all sorts of pretty stuff going on. OK, um, even if you can't see it, uh, it kind of doesn't matter. It's just like total gobbledygook. Um, anyone know what this program does? <laughs> Any guesses? Hello world. Hello world, pretty good guess. Um, so so there's, there's this kind of like, I guess it's like a thought experiment, right? Like if you take a large number of monkeys and uh, put them in front of a large number of keyboards and have them bang away at the keyboards, you'll eventually get like the greatest program known to humankind. Let's, let's see what we've got here. Pello World? Ugh. Uh, all, all right, almost. <laughs> so um, what could we do to make this more understandable? So, the obvious answer is, of course, write it in a way that's kind of more a standard way of writing these programs. But even um, barring that, is there anything? Is there anything that I could do with this program um, to make it more understandable, but leaving it in in this form essentially? Write more constants. Write more constants. Comments. comments. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I guess comments. Yes, comments could help. But. Um, uh, another way of kind of thinking about that is um, you could use a version control. So um, I link in the slides actually to a page where the author do like explains exactly how this program was constructed. And it starts off as a really straightforward Python program and then gets progressively more and more convoluted. Um, and if that were all in version control, it would be possible to trace back through the history of like how did this program evolve and understand at every step what was done to make it harder to understand um, and like why that was done. So that would be one way of actually, so that's kind of a form of commenting, but like a more implicit uh, commenting in that it's, it's documenting the progression and the development of the program rather than the final state necessarily. Um, I think one more thing that could be done is to use uh, a, unit t a test for this program. That would certainly explain at least what it did. You'd immediately see that it's supposed to print out hello world. Um, and you'd see that it fails. Anyone know where the error is? Um, yeah, it's a bit shift. Yeah. So it's turning strings into numbers and shifting them? Basically, yeah. <laughs> That's the way it kind of tries, it constructs the string through a bunch of like, um, like non string operations essentially. Because, yeah, strings are just ASCII uh, numbers in the ASCII table. Okay, thanks. So, right. Um, Uh, okay, so um, the last question that we need to answer, uh, which one of the uh, audience questions is also about, is like, how, where, um, how can I structure my project? Where can I put my data and my code so that other people can access it? Um, so for for code, I mean, yeah, the st standard answers are certainly valid. You know, put put your code on GitHub, on GitLab, on Bitbucket, on any of these tools that are widely used for storing code. Um, for, for, for data, I think the answer to that question is not, uh, is a little bit more diverse because um, it depends on a lot of other questions. Uh, but there are also standard repositories for data. There's Zenodo, um, there's Dataverse, there's domain specific repositories. Like if you're working on proteins or something like that, there's probably a repository where you put your protein structures. Um, and so on and so forth. But um, kind of getting uh, at, the, uh, at the audience question, um, certainly a viable solution for making data accessible is to, if you manage data using Git LFS, 
or within your project, um, then you can make it accessible via Git LFS as kind of part of the of the uh, part of the project. So you can store the data together with the code, and the LFS server can make that data available to anyone who wants to access it. Um, and right, the reproducibility platforms that we're going to look at in a minute um, also support hosting code and data. Um, certainly, yeah, Renku that I work on and CodeOcean both um, can host code and data, so you can also put put that there instead of putting it into GitHub um, if you if you choose to do so. Um, but here, the real uh, key is that you know. Share whatever you can um, if you're interested in uh, making something reproducible by external uh, members. If you're if you're just um, making it reproducible for yourself, this is not as as uh, key. But if you want other people to be able to use it, you do need to share something. And so there are certainly very valid reasons that you might not be able to share code or data. There might be licensing. There might be privacy concerns in your data um, that prevent you from publishing it. But even if you can't publish um, your code, maybe you can publish your data, or maybe vice versa. Or maybe if your data is a very privacy sensitive, you can publish some synthetic data so that people can at least understand the structure um, and uh, understand how your code interacts with the data. So do make an effort if you're interested in other people being able to reproduce your work uh, to publish whatever, whatever you can. OK, so just to not lose the, the forest for the trees here, um, I just want to go back and, and uh, look at the tools that we talked about and kind of give some um, suggestions about what, what you should actually dedicate a little bit of effort to becoming familiar with. So if you, if you work in Python and you're not familiar already with uh, requirements.txt or pip file or environment.yaml or some, you know, maybe not all of them, but at least one or maybe two of them, then um, you, you'll be doing yourself a favor by learning a little bit about that. Um, and furthermore, if you write Python uh, code yourself and you want to package it, um, then you should. it's certainly um, helpful to learn about how to package code in Python. There was a great tutorial from last year, uh, SciPy, uh, that discussed this. Um, and it's a good place to get kind of started with that. Um, you should definitely be familiar with Git, but everyone here is already familiar with Git, sounds like, which is great. And um, you should also be familiar with clean code practices, but I think uh, this is really obscenely large, sorry. Right, but um, it sounds like people here are also familiar with that. So uh, that's not so much of an issue. But, but um, requirements.txt, kind of knowing how that works and understanding how you can specify the environment that way will save you uh, trouble in the future. Um, I think that many people here probably don't need to know too much about Docker. Um, it's good to know that it exists, uh, but you probably don't need to like, be able to write your own Docker file because um, the tools that we're developing for reproducibility do that for you. So the goal is to kind of make this stuff as easy as possible for, for like a data scientist, someone who's not necessarily interested in, in um, getting tied up with these details. Uh, whereas a data engineer should probably know about Docker, but if you are a data engineer, you probably already do. Um, okay, so I'm going to do a brief section on, on just the tool landscape quickly, and then we're going to take a break. Yes? Sure. So the question is, what's a, what's a workflow manager um, or, or an example of a workflow manager? Um, so make is kind of one. <laughs> uh, most people don't think of it that way, but it's, it does what workflow managers do, which is you specify dependencies, you specify the outputs, and you specify what needs to be done to transform those dependencies into the outputs. Um, more tools that kind of more generally are designated as workflow managers, one is like Snakemake is something that's out there that some people might be familiar with. Um, in bioinformatics, there's a few ones that are widely used. There's one called Galaxy that some people might use. Some of these have these uh, really slick user interfaces where you can um, kind of draw a graph where just by like making boxes and collect connecting lines between them. Um, and some are, are, are textual-based uh, formats, uh, like closer to make. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. I do not know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, so the question is, uh, are s scientific publishers are starting more and more to demand that data data be published? Um, and that's certainly my experience. It's become kind of more um, uh, re required that if you want to publish your paper, you need to also make the data available. Um, but I think so. I think it's very, first of all, discipline specific as to how they expect that data to be made available. So, um, in my experience, for example, if you in in like if you're uh, working on proteins, uh, to go back to that example, then the expectation is that your uh, results are made available in the standard location for data in that field. And in another field, it might be somewhere else. And if there's no place specifically, then I think a lot of people are are happy with Zenodo or with Dataverse or something like that, some of these gen more general data repositories. Are those, are those repositories Absolutely. So um, the question was, is there any, uh, are those like, are, is there any guarantee that the data is available? So yes, uh, Zenodo and Dataverse both provide DOIs, uh, which is in order to um, have uh, the authorization to provide DOIs, you have to guarantee that the data will be available for at least 20 years. Um, and so both of those, uh, so Zenodo is a data repository that's run by CERN um, in Switzerland. Um, and it's kind of one of these cases where they have a ton of infrastructure that they use for their research anyway, and some of it's sitting around idle. And it's kind of, for them, not a big deal to make a little bit of it available for this purpose. So um, Zenodo is a free uh, place where you can store pretty much any kind of data. And if it's not um, insanely large, they don't, uh, like, it's, it's, they're, they're very generous with what you do there. Um, Dataverse is a bit more like uh, tied to academic institutions, and there's many Dataverse ins uh, implementation, not implementations, uh, installations out there. Um, but it's also similar, where like usually the institution um, provides the resources uh, for for the storage and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. Uh, so that, that it's kind of. Maybe a little bit of an unsatisfactory answer, but I think the, the, the answer is that it's really very, it depends a lot on exactly what field it is um, and maybe on other aspects uh, about, about the research that you're publishing. Okay, where am I? All right, I go to the next one. Okay, um, let me make this a bit bigger. Uh, right. So I'm not going to say a ton about this right now, but it's in the slides. Um, it's in the repository. So this is just a quick kind of table of all of the tools that, um, that I know about in this, in this space of reproducibility. So as you can see, there's a lot. And they do vary in terms of, um, in, in several different ways. One way that they uh, di are, are different is in how they um, present the interface to the users, who their target audience is. Some of these tools for reproducibility are aiming to uh, have data scientists as their users. Others are aiming to have like data engineers or data ops people as their users. Um, so there's a lot of diversity uh, in, in this list. Um, but I think what's kind of interesting is that you'll see that almost all of these are built basically on a really common set of tools. So everyone essentially uses Docker at some level to capture their environment. Um, like Binder kind of at the lowest level uses Docker. It has very clever ways of creating those, uh, those, those Docker environments uh, that make it very convenient and easy to use. Um, but if, if you kind of go down all the way to the bottom, you end up at Docker. Um, and everyone else basically uses Docker as well. Uh, similarly for code, there's been really convergence around Git. Git is the thing that everyone uses. Um, in some of the other aspects, they, they differ a bit more from one another. Um, but I just wanted to show you that there's a lot of uh, solutions being developed for the problem of reproducibility. If you're in the market for one, if you want something, then um, certainly recommend checking out what's out there and finding something that suits your needs um, because there's so many niches and so many uh, like little areas in there um, that there might be something that suits exactly what you need um, and it'll probably make your life a little easier if you use that. 
And in fact, actually, some of the people who developed some of these are here, too. So I think um, somebody from Holtail is going to be here at the conference, uh, and maybe some of the other ones as well. Um, but we're going to take a break now, uh, I think about 10 minutes. And afterwards, uh, we're going to get into the hands-on with Renku. Uh, then there'll be another break, and then we'll do the hands-on with Codition. So um, we're going to get started with the hands-on in a second, um, but just wanted to make sure that everyone uh, has the environment installed or is using one of those uh, server-based environments. If you don't have it installed or having some difficulties, um, please put a red sticky on your uh, on the, on your on your on the outside of your computer, and we'll uh, come around and help get you helped. So yeah, sorry, uh, it's a bit restless outside right now, so I'm just going to close the doors for a few minutes. Um, but I assume it'll calm down, and then we'll be able to open the, the doors again and get um, the cool air back in. Um, OK, so let's, let's get started with the hands-on part. Um, and the first part of the hands-on is going to be with a tool called Renku that I uh, uh, work on. Um, so if you're following along, uh, you should be at, at this location in the repository. The directory is notebooks03-renku. Uh, um, right now, I'm in the index uh, notebook. Um, we're going to move to one of the other notebooks in a minute. And again, if you get stuck or uh, anything, um, you can use the, the red post-it uh, to point that out or raise your hand. And if, you're making, uh, if you've completed the exercise, then uh, please put a green post-it on your computer. Um, and um, also, if, if you, I have some colleagues that are uh, accessible on Gitter, uh, so if you uh, have some questions, you can also try that channel as well. So um, gitter.im, Swiss Data Science Center, uh, Renku. Um, all right, so let me, let me introduce Renku briefly. Um, so Renku is software for doing reproducible data science. And we aim to make your data science both directly and conceptually reproducible. So there's two parts to Renku. Uh, there's the CLI, the command line interface. Um, and there's the server Renku lab. Uh, and the distinction between these is pretty similar to the one between Git and uh, GitLab or GitHub. So uh, Git is a suite of command line tools for managing, uh, doing version control in one project. And GitLab and GitHub are server uh, environments that make it possible to manage multiple projects, uh, sh share projects, collaborate, give access to things. Um, and the distinction between Renku and Renku Lab is, is similar. Um, so Renku is a suite of command line tools for working reproducibly on one project. Renku Lab is a server environment for sharing and collaborating on projects. And one of the nice things it includes is like a zero install environment for, um, for running code uh, that's, that's part of a project, making changes. And you can completely actually develop just uh, in the Renku Lab server. You don't need to install anything on your laptop. Uh, many of our users actually do projects that way. Um, uh, and, and just as with GitHub um, and Git, you can start the project on the server, um, which, as I said, is kind of how most of our, our users do it. Um, or you can start it locally on your computer, and then it's straightforward to transition from one location to the other. Um, so since this is SciPy and an audience of, of very technically minded people, I figured we'd just go ahead and dive into the deep end and go right into the uh, Renku command line. Um, and we'll go look at Renku Lab a little bit later in the, in the tutorial. 
Um, so how does this look? Ah, it's pretty small. Um, let me see. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that we're trying to enable with uh, Renku. So this is a project that in, from hydrology. Can, okay, it, the, the details don't matter, really, so it's okay. You don't need to read it. Um, you just need to kind of see that there's boxes and lines up there, um, and that's sufficient. <laughs> um, but yeah, what I wanted to point out is uh, that what, um, this, is, this is from a project in hydrology uh, where the researchers were, were working with Renku to um, manage their data science. And um, as a side effect of working with Renku, you can easily generate visualizations like this that show kind of how results were derived and make it possible to kind of schematically explain exactly what you did. So um, in this graph here, if you can't, I, I, I know many of you can't read it, um, but up, up here in the upper left corner, um, there's the first step, which is generate model inputs. And it shows that it takes these two um, files as an input. Uh, it generates this as an output. And it takes several other inputs, some Fortran code and uh, some other things. And that gets all thrown in to a box which represents uh, compiling the model and optimizing it. Um, and then there's several other steps that get run, selecting uh, the best 5%, rerunning the best models, calculating the boundaries and uh, uncertainties, until we get down to the bottom uh, where the results are plotted. So this, this is just purely generated from the information that's in Renku. Um, it's tweaked a little bit to make it a little easier to read, uh, but the information comes directly from Renku. It's not like somebody had to think and put this together. Uh, we just read it right out of the system. Um, and so the whole point is uh, we're aiming to make it possible to do data science in a way that you can very easily track and understand how the results uh, that you arrive at were derived. OK, so um, we're going to now do a bit of hands-on work with Renku so you get a feel for how it works and what it can do, um, and how we're going to also think about how we can work reproducibly um, doing data science. So we're going to work with some data from the US Department of Transportation, Bureau of Transportation Statistics, and we're going to try to answer the following very simple question, how many flights were there to Austin, Texas in January 2019? Um, so it's, yeah, the tools that we're going to use for this are kind of overdimensioned for such a simple task. Uh, but I think it's, very, it's a good way of illustrating the, the process of working reproducibly. So um, how many people here work with Jupyter Notebooks? Oh, OK, right, great, a lot of people. Um, that's good, because that's what we're going to do. So Renku is not in any way specific for Jupyter Notebooks. It doesn't have any special support for Jupyter Notebooks, in fact. It's really general purpose. It's designed to make it possible to execute any kind of program um, and chain things together and build pipelines in a way that's reproducible. But it is possible to do this with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and um, there, I mean, so notebooks are kind of an interesting um, Phenomenon, right? One second. Let me open these doors so we get a little bit more cool air in here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, if you talk to people who are really focused on reproducibility, um, many of them kind of complain about notebooks. Notebooks have a lot of a lot of weird quirks that make it difficult to do things reproducibly uh, in them. So Jupyter Notebooks, as one example, um, the uh, order in which the cells are executed need not be um, a, need not conform to any standard. Right? You can arbitrarily execute cells um, in any order, and you can use information that might be available from a different point at any other point, uh, which makes it kind of hard to understand uh, what notebooks like what, what actually happened within the notebook. Um, and also, the format has some other the quirks that make it difficult um, for, for systems for reproducibility. But uh, they actually have some, some nice uh, characteristics as well. Like you can very 
a nicely interspersed format of text with code and explain what things are happening, include uh, uh, pictures and images and stuff like that. So they also have some, some, some benefits for reproducibility. Um, there's a, a paper uh, called 10, 10 Simple Rules for Reproducible Research in Jupyter Notebooks uh, that was put together. It's on archive. Um, and it was compiled, this advice was compiled by uh, a group of people that are very integrally uh, integrated in the, in the Jupyter Notebook community. Um, and this is the advice that they come up with for how you do this. It's very similar to what we were talking about in the first part of the, uh, the tutorial. Um, but I'm just going to kind of highlight a few different things here. So um, while, while you're developing, they encourage you to tell a story uh, with, your, with your code and with your analysis and document that in the, in the, in the notebook. They also tell you to, to document the process for how you derive the results and how you, not only that, but how your code base evolved, how your notebooks evolved. Uh, when working with code, they encourage you to write modular code. That's code that's going to be easier to understand and easier to extend and easier to reuse. Um, they say record your dependencies so that we can recreate the environment in which the code runs, use version control, um, and build a pipeline. So a pipeline is the same as a workflow, uh, where in a pipeline, uh, each step of the pipeline takes something as an input, potentially, and writes something as an output, um, which is then consumed by the next step in the pipeline. And um, then as you follow the entire chain of the pipeline, you end up at the final result in the end. Um, and then, yeah, there's some, some general advice, of course, like make sure your data is shared and um, make sure that it's when, when your notebook is published that it's in a place where you can actually explore it and execute it and try things out. Um, and uh, we're, we're going to use some of the features of Renku to realize um, some of these aspects of, uh, of these rules. Um, so, right, actually, let me get to it in the next clip. So um, as we're doing it, let me introduce the kind of cast of characters that we're going to see. Let me make this a little bigger. Um, just so that you've kind of at least seen some of these things that might be unfamiliar to you um, before we actually need to use them. So, the, the bang, or the exclamation point. Do, have people seen that in Jupyter Notebooks? Few nodding of heads, okay, right. So what that does is um, it's a way of executing a shell command within a notebook. So the tools that we're using, uh, we're, gonna use, we're gonna use Git a lot, and we're gonna use Renku. These are both command line tools. So they're generally designed to be run uh, from, from a terminal. For the purpose of the tutorial, we're going to run them within a notebook. And in order to do that, we're going to have to execute shell commands. And so that's why you'll see the bang so much. Uh, we're going to be copying stuff around. So this is not because this is how you're supposed to work with Renku, but because um, we're, we're trying to focus on, on reproducibility. We're not focusing on like pandas or, or something like that. So we're going to shortcut some of the, the data science parts of the process by just copying the answer right there and then um, focus on the reproducibility of it. Uh, but that's the only reason we're going to see copy so much. So it's not an integral part of Renku. Um, it's just to speed up the tutorial. We're going to be using Git um, to track progress and the evolution of our code. And we're going to see this kind of three command dance a lot, where we do git status to see what's changed, git add to add anything that's changed, and git commit um, to, to uh, inform git about those changes. And we're going to provide useful commit messages. Uh, but I think everyone says they, they're familiar with git, so I'm assuming that uh, that won't be surprising to anyone. Does anyone use paper mill? No one. OK, wow. Um, Papermill is one of the tools that the authors of that uh, list of guidelines for how you do re reproducible research in Jupyter Notebooks recommend. So Papermill solves um, that one problem that I mentioned with notebooks, which is that cells can be run in arbitrary order. Papermill is a tool that takes as a um, input a notebook that represents a template and it spits out another notebook as an output. And that notebook that's the output has been run in a way that's guaranteed to be from top to bottom. Papermill also solves one other um, 
difficulty with doing reproducible research with Jupyter, uh, which is it makes it possible to easily parameterize notebooks. So normally, kind of making a notebook where you can um, provide some parameters for how it should execute is not so straightforward. But with Papermill, um, there's a there's a there's a built-in solution that makes that possible. Um, it's very cute, actually, how it's done, uh, and and it makes it possible to build pipelines with Jupyter, where you can say execute this notebook, and this should be the input file, and it should write the output to this location, and then um, have another notebook that reads from the the previous output. Something that's kind of difficult to do in a normal notebook environment. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to see Renku, who's kind of the star of this part of the show. So it's not surprising that that's um, a main character. So we're going to um, spend a bit of time just starting a project, importing data. We're doing data science, right? So we need some data to analyze. Um, then once we've got that done, we're going to build a pipeline where um, we take, we make steps that are implemented as Jupyter notebooks that take an input, produce an output, um, which gets fed into another notebook, uh, which does some work as well. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at sharing uh, the results, making it possible for others to view what's been done, uh, making it possible for others to, to try out and execute um, notebooks uh, that you've written. And I'm going to work in a break in there, I think. Uh, it's probably going to be a bit long. So probably sometime um, like around the pipeline section, we'll, we'll take a break. Uh, OK, so let's get started. So everyone can now enter this getting started notebook. Um, and uh, let me see if I can do this more comfortably. Sorry. OK. Um, so is that legible to everyone? Can anyone not read that? Raise your hand. OK, great. Um, We're going to start, this is not actually part of Renku, but I just want to make sure that your environment is uh, properly, properly configured, um, because depending on how you started the project, you might not have uh, the Git information available. So everyone, please just execute that first cell um, that reports back what the Git config is. Um, and you should have a username and an email configured. Um, and if you don't, you can uncomment uh, these two lines in the next cell to uh, set a username and email, because otherwise Git's going to complain a lot, and it's going to be a little annoying. OK. So um, all right. First thing we want to do when starting a project is to create a repository for our project. In Git, you initialize the repository with Git init. In Renku, you initialize it with anyone? Renku init, right? Yeah. So Renku init and the, the name of the project. We're going to call ours Renku Tutorial Flights. Execute that, and we get back a response that we initialized an empty project in there. Um, before we start doing anything with it, I just want to show you what's inside of there. Um, the uh, Renku repository is actually a Git repository with some extra files um, generated by Renku. So two of these are this file that's the Docker file and uh, requirements.txt. So um, Renku it does support different templates. Um, and if you were using a like an R template, you wouldn't get a requirements.txt file. You get like some R thing in there. Um, but the default template is the Python template. Um, so we get a requirements.txt. 
Uh, it's initially empty, but it's there as a reminder that you need to declare your environment so that Renku can make your work reproducible. Um, additionally, there's a Docker file that's generated. It's not, you, you can mess around with it if you need to, but um, for most users, it shouldn't be necessary, which is why kind of I mentioned like, uh, if you're a data scientist, um, I, I really think you, do, you, you need to know that Docker is out there, but um, I'm hoping that you don't need to actually uh, understand it in any great level of detail because there's a lot of us who are building tools um, that do use Docker, but kind of hide uh, some of the more uh, complicated stuff with Docker um, away from you because you don't really need to bother with that. So um, this is a default Docker file for a Python project which knows kind of how to create a Python environment and make that available. Um, there's also a version that's kind of uses the conda environment.yaml file, but this is the one that's the requirements.txt, which is the most easy one to use. Okay, so um, now Renku, just like Git, um, Renku's commands are designed to be run within the repository. So just like if you do git status or something like that in some random directory, you're gonna get some like kind of useless uh, response. Renku works similarly. If Renku is not run within a Renku directory, it gives like a, kind of a not very useful response um, because it's designed to be run within a Renku project. So let's go change, I'm gonna change directory into my Renku project so that all my Renku commands make sense. All right, um, next thing I wanna do is to declare the environment that I'm going to work in. Um, so I typically kind of use a bunch of Python libraries when I'm doing data science, pandas, numpy, scimpy, matplotlib, and seaborn, and so on. Um, but in this case, I know, uh, actually, I'm just gonna use uh, pandas. So, ah, where am I? Um, one second. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go go ahead and go right in here and uh, this requirements.txt file. So I could do this, but someone pointed out earlier um, that this isn't a great idea for reproducibility. Um, it's sufficient to ensure that my code will will run again but um, it doesn't pin down the version of, uh, of my dependencies enough to actually make it really, really reproducible. So what I'm really gonna need to do is to specify what version pandas that I've got. I think it's something like this. Um, and specify my requirements.txt file that way. I'm just gonna take a look. Uh, we can look in here, yeah. So, um, right, exactly, I'm using pandas.2.42. So let's just go ahead and specify that that way. Okay, great. Um, and if you're following along, you don't need to edit these files yourself. You can just copy uh, some provided versions of them for you. So, as we work with Renku, we need to track our progress uh, using Git. So if I ask Git what the status is, it comes back and tells me that I've modified requirements.txt, which is true, I did do that. So now I'm gonna need to tell Git what I did. So I'm gonna add the requirements.txt file and I'm gonna give it a useful commit message. So what did I do? I declared the Python environment for the project. Okay, gets happy, um, and now we can kind of move on. So now we've got our environment declared, and of course you can change that requirements.txt file at any point in time, and Renku will then you know update the environment as necessary. Um, but since I already know I'm about to start working with pandas, I might as well put that in there right now. So now we're, we're going to do some data science. We need some data. Um, Renku uh, can import data from a variety of sources, but wherever you get the data from, um, it, it's generally kind of bundled together in the form of a data set. A data set makes it possible to group uh, like files that are related in some way together in, into one kind of package that shares some metadata. So um, 
uh, before I get my data, I'm going to go ahead and create a data set, and I'm going to call it flights. The command for doing that is renku data set create, and then the name. And then that's going to come back and tell me that it created the data set. And now um, I can add some data to the data set. So this is kind of um, a question that somebody else had asked uh, in the break. Um, in, in Renku, it's possible to get data from a variety of sources. So uh, Renku supports repositories like Zenodo or anything that can provide a DOI, like Dataverse or whatever. Um, you can also import data from other Renku projects, um, any, any Git repository, uh, somewhere on the file system, or a URL. So if you're using a data repository or something like that, then Renku will remember that it got the data from this location, and that can be used later for provenance, so that when you produce a result, it's possible to trace it back to where, where it originally came from. Uh, in this case, we're going to just import our data from a URL, um, but there's still a little bit of metadata that's captured around that, and I'll show you in a second. So this is the, the URL that contains the, the data that we're going to work with, and um, the command to add data to a data set is data set add. Um, then the name of the, the data set, in this case flights, and then uh, the URL or the path or whatever uh, to the data. So I'm going to plop that URL in there. Might take a second. I don't know how fast the network is here. OK, that wasn't too bad. So. Um, comes back with the response that the data set's been added. So let's see exactly um, what we've got now. Um, using the command ls files to list files, I can ask the data set to list the files that it knows about um, uh, in the flights data set. So this spits out a table um, that contains some metadata about uh, what I've got. It has the path to where the data is currently located, um, the data set that's in there, and the person who, who acquired it, who added it to the system. In this case, me, uh, presumably in your uh, computers, it'll be you yourselves, um, and the time, the date and the time in which that was done. So especially for things that are like um, on the internet, this is super useful, right? Because uh, stuff that's on the internet can change. But uh, Renku knows exactly when you grab that data. So you can at least know, OK, this was current as of uh, this particular date. OK. Um, let's do a few exercises together, maybe. Why not? You can shout out the answer. So I'm going to go back to the, uh, the main project directory. And um, we're going to create a new, uh, we're going to create a second repository for a second project that we're going to work on. Um, how do I make a Renku repository called Renku Tutorial Diamonds? Exactly. <laughs> so that one's pretty easy. And then I get that. OK. And how do I create a data set in there? Exactly. Uh, no, not quite. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Almost. Renku data set create is the uh, right answer. Set create, and we're going to call it diamonds. Oops. Oh, what do I? Oh, I know what the problem is. Um, I'm in the wrong directory. Yeah, somebody said that. I need to change directory into there. So, uh, exactly. If I don't, if I don't execute the Renku commands in the right directory, it doesn't know where to where to do its stuff. But once I'm in the right directory, um, I can call Renku dataset create diamonds, and it's going to create that dataset. And then um, I've got uh, another file uh, with some information about diamonds, um, and I want to add that to that dataset. So somebody said the answer already early, kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Renku dataset add, and then the URL. Add 
Thank you. <laughs> there we go. So if anyone is on Windows, um, in the, yeah, your Renko uses symbolic links. Um, there is in the setup information uh, some incantations that you can use to allow normal users to create symbolic links on Windows. Uh, you can do that, or you can use one of the the zero install environments to to you to to do Renku. So I've got a couple of links in there um, that make it possible to run through the tutorial uh, on on Renku Lab, on Code Ocean, or on Binder. Um, so for Renku Lab and Code Ocean, you need to register. I think the Binder link should just work, where you uh, just point your browser at that. That might be a little bit easier if you um, uh, didn't go through uh, the 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 setup for for allowing symbolic links for regular users. Uh, wait, you're on a Mac. You can't. That's that I'm must be stuck stuck. something else. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, if you're getting stuck with red tags on your, can you come around and help you? Yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah. I have a question. yeah. So, you're pointing to the actual URL. Can you point to a specific app on your computer instead? On your computer instead, definitely. Yeah, you can do that. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right, exactly. So the question was, um, if if you uh, added the uh, the data set that um, again, uh, would it save two versions of that file? It would. So it would know that you downloaded it on this date and then again on this date. Um, assuming that it had changed, if it hadn't changed, then it will it'll just ignore it. But if if the if the contents had changed, then it will create a new version. Okay, so I'm gonna oh um, continue. <laughs> uh, so see the binder. Oh yeah, uh, let me show you. Um, right. Ah. The link to the Jupyter, uh, to the binder uh, version of this is on the GitHub page. It's right here. So if you go to the GitHub repository uh, for the project, I, I'll just pl I'll just chat that into um, into Slack. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I should have done that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so I've chatted that into um, Slack. Uh, but so I think the majority of people are kind of completed with that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna continue, keep things moving along, um, and so we can now go to the second step of this, which is the pipeline. Um, so if you click on that link on the on the index page. OK. All right, let me, let me come on.
Yeah. So, um, uh, one of the participants had a problem where he, let me show you what he, wait, let me show you what the thing was. Um, does anyone know what this does in a Jupyter notebook? So, you're sm smiling, so I'm guessing you know what it does. It does not. It changes. Yeah, watch. Um, watch. <laughs> uh, or PW. Yeah, good. Thank you. That's a better idea. Um, let me just show you this. So, uh, oh, I need to write. <laughs> so, it doesn't change the directory for that execution. Uh, so, let me make it even more obvious. Um, what's a. Uh, Yeah, good idea, right. <laughs> uh, right, it doesn't change that. So what the bang does is it creates a new like process and then changes the directory in that and then it returns and so kind of it's done nothing because you, you don't do anything in that process. In order to actually change a directory and um, kind of keep that persistent, you need to use the magic the percent CD. Super tricky. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you're, yeah. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's a problem that other people are having. OK. Um, all right, so yeah, it looks like kind of people have uh, mostly sorted out that. There's a couple of uh, lingering cases of people being stuck. But um, let me move on to the, the next step. We'll work through this one, and then we're going to take a break. I think that'd be a good idea. OK. So building a pipeline. So that was one of the pieces of advice in that article, um, reproducible research with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, they recommend building a pipeline. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to use the tool paper mill, and we're going to use Renku to kind of plug things together. So we're going to make a pipeline with two steps, really simple. The first step is going to uh, read in the data. That contains all of the flights, um, I believe, uh, in, within the US. I don't know if it's continental or, or the US in general, but it contains um, all of the flights that happened in January of 2019 uh, within the US. And we're going to just select the ones that are in Austin, Texas, uh, that, that have Austin, Texas as the termination um, as the destination. Uh, we're going to write that to a file. And then we're going to read that in the second step and count the number of flights. So for each step, the process of doing it is exactly the same. We're going to create a notebook that, that does that, that work that we want done. Um, we're going to tell Git about the changes that we made. And then we're going to use a combination of Renku and uh, this paper mill tool to run the notebook reproducibly. Um, so I, I really want to emphasize that Renku is not at all a uh, Jupyter Notebook specific tool, um, but together with Papermill, it can uh, make it possible to run notebook, notebooks reproducibly. So the Renku run command has the following syntax. It's Renku run and then just anything, like anything that's a shell command afterwards. Um, what Renku does when it runs is it takes note of what the inputs to that command were. It detects the outputs of the command, and then it remembers that um, and creates a workflow step from that, which can later be executed again. So let's change directory into our Renku repository again, because we're in a new notebook and we're no longer in the uh, same location as we were before. Um, and then let's get to work. So uh, we, we don't, if you remember, the, the current contents of this project are just a Docker file under requirements.txt file. Um, but we're about to write some notebooks, and we need a place to put them. I could just drop them into the root of the project, uh, but I want to have a little bit more of a structure to my project. I'm going to create a notebooks directory to put those in so that later, when somebody's coming to look at the project, they know where all the notebooks are. So right, create the notebooks directory. And now we're going to write a notebook to filter the flights. Um, actually, let me just go ahead and do this. Notebooks, I can also just kind of create a new notebook. Um, 
Right. So this is this is basically what we're going to do. We're going to do import pandas as pd. Let's run that. Um, then uh, I'm going to declare some parameters I need. Um, I think this is going to be data slash flights. Uh, hello. Oh, it's, it wasn't 2019. Oh, there it is. <laughs> right. Uh, I'm going to set that as the input path. I'm going to provide an output path. Uh, um, let's go do that. Oh, uh, this needs to be and now we'll just read in that, that thing, uh, the data frame. Um, and we get all these flights. We're just going to select that down to... Uh, Destination is equal to Austin. Actually, let's, let's mess this up. <laughs> uh, and so that's, that's all we're basically going to do. Um, let me just go ahead and destroy this. doesn't matter. Uh, Okay, so uh, I'm just I'm just going to copy this over because there's one kind of little trick to this uh, that so what I've written here is basically the same as what what we saw. There's a bit more comments um, in this version. Then at the end, I save the result to a CSV file. So uh, import pandas, read in the data, select only flights to Austin, and then I save the result. Um, there's a little trick here to using paper mill, though. Um, paper mill requires some metadata on the cells so that it knows which cell contains the parameters that you might want to modify uh, when you run it using paper mill. So you just add, you can add a tag um, to any cell, uh, and the tag has to be has to say parameters. And that that informs Papermill when it executes that that's the cell that contains the default values of all of the uh, information that you might want to that you might want to modify. Um, if if there's no override that's specified, you get this default value. If there is one, uh, then that gets that overwrites this value. Okay, so we wrote our notebook, um, and now we check Git and we see. Uh, Git's dirty. So what do we do? If Git says there's untracked changes. Add. Exactly right. We do git add. And we're going to say something that explains what we did. Like, uh, we created a notebook that filters flights to Austin, Texas. Great. Um, git status afterwards reports clean. Nothing, nothing's there. So. Um, okay, all in, well and good so far, nothing uh, mind-blowing um, up to this point. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to run the notebook in a reproducible way. Um, because as we talked about before, I could have run, I could have stepped, I could have executed the cells in any arbitrary order, um, making it confusing for someone who later wants to understand what happened. So I'm going to run this notebook using paper mill in a reproducible way. And I'm going to specify the input path um, for where the original files are and the output path where it should write the filtered uh, values. And then that's going to feed into the next step of the pipeline. So it's going to um, read in all the flights, write out just the ones that are to Austin. Um, and then the next step is going to uh, uh, read in just the Austin flights and count them. So I'm going to execute this cell here. Um, and I first create a directory for my output uh, values. Otherwise, uh, there's going to be some complaints that um, the file that it wants to write to doesn't exist. So we run that. OK. 
Okay, that's executed. And now um, I can navigate over to this notebook that's called uh, Dot ran. This is a convention with paper mill. Um, so the paper mill uh, command takes requires has two arguments that it requires uh, the notebook file that it should execute as a template and the uh, path to where the output should go. Um, and then there's the optional parameters, uh, which are dependent on what your notebook takes as parameters. Uh, my notebook has two parameters: input path and output path, and I specify them with the uh, dash p uh, flag. So let's just go take a look at this ran notebook. Um, this is the, the cute trick that Papermill does. When you declare a cell as being parameters, it just writes a new cell directly after that with any values uh, that are provided on the command line, thereby overriding uh, those values when it executes uh, from top to bottom. Um, the only difference between these two is that the um, paths are specified slightly differently, whereas when you execute the notebook um, in the first way, uh, the paths are relative to the notebook's path, um, but when I execute it with paper mail, the paths are relative to where that command is being executed. So for that reason, uh, the data folder is in a uh, different place in those, in those two versions. Reads in the data, selects only the flights to Austin, uh, and then it writes it out. Okay, so far, so good. Now we do the next step, uh, where we, we're gonna count the flights. I've already gotten a pre-written notebook here um, with those results. Let's just take a look at it. Again, import pandas, specify what file it should read, where it wants the output to go. Um, reads in the files from the input path, which is the filtered flights, so just those to Austin. Uh, counts them, and then um, just kind of print some results saying how many flights there were to Austin. And in this case, I'm also going to write it to a file. But again, this is all very dependent on what, what your uh, workflow is going to do. So this is our workflow where we're just counting flights to Austin. OK. So again, this is getting kind of repetitive, right? Which is exactly the idea, that we need to just get into this flow where we start um, just automatically kind of tracking our progress by informing Git every time we do something. We've created a new notebook now. We see it here. We just add it to Git, provide a useful commit message. In this case, create a uh, notebook that counts flights to Austin, Texas. And then everything's clean. And now um, we're going to run this with paper mail. Once more, uh, the input is going to be the filtered flights. The output is going to be that file that says what uh, the count of the flights. And, and now we have a pipeline in Renku. All we did was we ran commands, um, provided inputs, um, and did that with Renku run. And Renku detected that uh, the input of the second command was the output of the first command. It realized that those things need to be plugged together. And it um, generates a pipeline. So I'll show you what that pipeline looks like. Uh, it's not a very beautiful way of displaying it. You might not be able to execute the cell. It depends on whether you have dot in your environment. But if you don't, it's OK. Let me just make this a little bit bigger. <laughs> so um, we see here this is like a schematic description of everything that's been done. So um, these ones with the square rectangular boxes are uh, the workflow steps. The oval ones are the inputs to the workflow step. So we see here, um, we start off with two inputs, the, the full uh, uh, CSV of, of all the flights, um, the notebook that filters them, and then it's run using paper mill. And that outputs uh, the notebook that's the ran notebook and the filtered flights CSV file, which is then fed into another command, um, which uh, takes the count notebook as an input and then produces two outputs, uh, the, the RAN for the count notebook and uh, this text file that displays the, the final um, count of the flights. So we can go look at this, and we can see that there's 23,078 flights to Austin, Texas, which sounds a little weird, right? Because Austin's not that big of an airport. Um, but we're going to go fix that in a bit. 
But I suggest now um, you take like a like a 10, 15 minute break. Uh, people have any questions that they need answered, I can also walk around a bit and help them. Um, and there's some exercises to do that kind of duplicate this uh, kind of work um, on our Diamonds tutorial uh, play, play project. So I'm sorry, the temperature keeps increasing in here and nothing seems to, no one seems to be coming to sort that out. Um, Hopefully keeping the doors open is a little bit, at least, of a solace there. Uh, so I think like, people are making, making good progress. Uh, many people have already completed this. Um, and some people are you know, working on it, but, but uh, moving along. So I wanted to go ahead and um, just kind of, uh, uh, right. Um, move to the move to the next section. Uh, right. Yeah. Great. We still have an hour and a half. Right. Um, where uh, the second part of the the building a pipeline. So so we, we made we made this pipeline now. Um, uh, where we're doing two steps. We're selecting only flights to Austin and then we're counting the number of flights. Um, and we're, I want to continue working with, with, what, with what we've got so far. So actually, before I do this, let me just, sh let, let, I just want to show you some stuff, right? So um, let's see. So this is kind of what working reproducibly, reproducibly is about. So if I do git log, I now have an entire history of everything that I've done. Um, I made reasonable commit messages so I can go back later and understand, okay, how did this whole project evolve? I initialized the repository, declared the Python environment, created a data set with flights, I added data to that. Um, I created a notebook to filter flights to Austin, Texas. Uh, I executed using Renku Run. Um, that, that notebook uh, with something as an input, I created a notebook to count the flights, and then I executed again with Renku Run, uh, a notebook that uh, took the flights that were just to Austin and uh, counted them. So um, I can go back and trace everything that I've done. Uh, so what I'm showing you now, so that, that's the kind of, that's the, the reproducible data science part of this, right? So that's how we work in a way that we can later um, go back and understand uh, how the results were derived. So Renku does um, some nice things for us where it's building these workflows uh, that make it possible to re-execute and recreate the results. Um, it's tracking provenance, it's keeping track of metadata, it knows when I downloaded this file. So because maybe three months later this file gets updated, they realize they miscounted and they forgot some flight and they add it to there, um, that file might change. And because I've been working with Renku, it knows when it downloaded the file and if I re-download it, um, as someone asked, uh, it will detect that there's a change to that file and that it's now out of date. Um, so. My personal feeling, I don't, I don't know if you agree with this, is that working this way is not a lot more work uh, than just the way you normally work with notebooks. So you normally just fire up a notebook, start messing around with it, um, like looking at things. And so the way I work, at least, is my initial notebooks tend to be super messy. Um, and then I kind of extract the stuff that I like from them, put them into new notebooks, and uh, try, try to like progressively clean up what I've done so that people can later understand it. And uh, working this way is not, is not too much different. We, we kind of skip the messy stuff um, because it's a very, very simple project. But in practice, if I'd done this uh, in a more real life project, that's probably how I would have started. I would have um, initially just kind of played around with the data, tried to understand what's going on, and then extracted the bits that I liked in my, from my notebook, if I were working with notebooks, into new notebooks, um, and then uh, continued working with them that way. And so the little bit of extra work necessary to kind of make this pipeline is pretty minimal. And I personally work with Git uh, anyway, so that's not a real change to my workflow either. Um, and now what I want to show you, this is, this is a kind of more looking into the future. So these are the features of Renku that we're still working on. And um, it might not work for everyone. But it should work for most of you, I think. Um, which is, so a lot of the, 
the discourse around reproducibility is kind of very, like if you think of like carrots and sticks, uh, it's very kind of stick based, right? Like science is reproducible. If you're not working reproducibly, you're not doing science and whatnot. Um, which is true, it's not, it's not incorrect, but um, I feel like there's kind of a lack of carrots there. Um, and I wanna show you that there are carrots to be found, like that working this way really actually makes it possible for the system to do stuff for you because, because we've been working reproducibly and because we've been tracking all these things that we've been doing, um, the system knows a lot about what you're trying to do and how your results are derived and it can detect things that might change and tell you that you might need to update um, some other parts of your results when, uh, when that change is found. So, well, where am I? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm already in the right directory. Um, right, so I'm gonna do a little example here where, um, let's see what happens when I modify that notebook. So I know many of you realized uh, and noticed that I actually wasn't selecting flights to Austin, I was selecting flights to DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth, it's a much larger airport, and that's why we had so many um, flights in January to, DF, uh, to Austin, when they were actually to DFW. So let's go ahead and fix that. Oops, I uh, didn't need to execute that, sorry. Um, so all I needed to do was to uh, change that, that text there, um, not select flights to DFW, uh, but select flights to Austin, and now I'm gonna save this notebook. Uh, right, and that's kind of shown here that you can do this. Um, now the next thing I need to do is, I've made a change, I need to go tell Git that I've done something. I'm gonna go and say, I've corrected the city in the filter uh, from DFW to Austin. Now I'm gonna look at the status, right? Okay, so um, when you're working, what do you normally do when you've done some analysis and you change the code that's somewhere in that analysis pipeline? Oh, thank you very much. You're Sorry, Bob. <laughs> <That's, laughs> uh, so hopefully it's gonna get a little cooler in here. Um, so what do you normally do when, when you make a change to your code somewhere along the path to the final result? Git commit, yeah, that's the first thing you do, definitely. And then how do you, um, now your results are probably no longer up to date, right? You, you run, but do, how do you do that? How do you run everything? <laughs> and anyone, like, is, is this something that people have encountered where they've done something and then they, they realize there's a bug in their code or they were doing something incorrectly or they found out that there's a better solution to something that they were doing and then they changed their code? All my, all my code is perfect. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
just like Git has that status command that tells you, oh, the, the following uh, files are not tracked or have been modified, there's a Renku status command that does something similar um, based on the workflows that it's captured. So Renku status looks and sees if any part of the pipeline has been updated. This could be the data. This could be the code. And if so, it goes and, s and finds out what depends on that and comes back and reports that to you. So what we see here, Renku is telling us, is that I just modified that filter flights uh, notebook and I changed uh, DFW to Austin. And it sees that all of these files depended on that notebook. So the filtered um, results of the flights depends on that notebook. Uh, the, 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 the paper mill ran notebook depends on that. The count flights ran notebook depends on that. And the final count.txt that I'm writing um, where I'm saying how many flights to Austin occurred, that depends on that. And um, what I can also do is just tell Renku, OK, go and update everything. You've realized that all this stuff has changed. Uh, go, and, go and fix it. And yeah, this is the part where I keep my fingers crossed. Uh, and let's see. So it's now it's taking a bit of time because it's going through and it has to find out. It's like re-executing every one of those steps um, that depends on on an output from uh, the notebook that changed. And then now it runs to, to completion. And now I can go and look at um, my results file and I see oh there's only around 5,000 flights to us, and that makes much more sense. Um, and I can also, since I've been tracking everything with Git, I can actually go back and diff my results. And I can, I can ask the system, uh, what, what exactly changed? And I can see here both versions. Um, the earlier versions had uh, 23,078 flights to Austin um, because it had confused Austin with DFW. And the second version has only around 5,000 because we corrected that. Um, so uh, this is a bit to make the case that like uh, systems like like Renku and and others potentially uh, can take advantage of the information that you provide to them as you work reproducibly and save you effort um, and make it possible to uh, to systematically like update things, not rely on your memory, um, which is completely not not reproducible because only you remember that. If somebody else needs to execute that, they have no idea what needs to be done. But because the information is stored um, within Renku, it's possible to take advantage of that and do work for you. So. Um, I'm actually I'm going to skip these next few exercises in the in the interest of kind of moving along, and I just want to show you one more thing. Then we'll take another break, and we'll switch gears and go to Code Ocean. Um, so the next thing I want to show you is that um, one one of the one of the one of the important things about working reproducibly is that you share your data and you share your code, and you make it possible for other people to uh, try things out. So in um, Renku, we uh, have a built-in solution to this, which is in the form of Renku Lab, which is our server, uh, where you can give other people access to projects that you're working on in Renku. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to do all of this right now, uh, but just going to show you what it looks like in the end. So what we do with, with, with what we can do with the project is, um, well, yeah, let's go ahead and do some of this stuff. So. If I'm going to share my project, I probably need a README so that other people can understand what it's about. Um, so I've got I've got a README already prepared right here um, that I'll show you in a second. So I'm going to add a README to my project, and then I can push it uh, to the server. Um, the server is just a Git server, so it's just a Git push command uh, that, if you aren't already familiar with, can easily find out a whole lot about. And in the end we end up with uh, something like this. So this is, you know, like when you watch cooking shows, like they always kind of skip some of the parts and you kind of see the prepared dish. Uh, this is exactly that. So I, I uh, worked this tutorial and I pushed the version to the server. And uh, this is what it looks like on Renku Lab um, under this URL. Um, so, uh, Renku Lab works very similarly to, uh, to GitLab or GitHub, where it 
gives you access to projects and shows you the contents of the files and stuff like that. Um, if you look at the project initially, you see the readme uh, for it right here. I can go take a look at the files. I can go look at the notebooks. I can see this notebook that ran. Um, I can see the outputs to that and so on. This is the filtering one and in the counting one. Ah, it's pretty, it's really small. Um, yeah, sorry, bad typeface choice there. Uh, but you can kind of go, even without access uh, to an environment to execute them, you can take a look at what was done. Since we were, in this case, working with notebooks, um, we've, we've documented what's, what's happening so that someone who might not know how to read Python or understand the code can still kind of follow along what happened. So we saw we read, it, read in the flights to Austin, Texas. Looks plausible. Uh, when we look at the output of the CSV file, we see all of the destinations are Austin, counts flights, and uh, we get this response over here. So it's possible for someone who um, either might not have an interest in setting up an environment uh, to run this code or uh, might not be capable of doing that to still see what you did uh, with your project. But furthermore, for someone who does want to mess around with it, we do offer, um, as part of Renku Lab, the ability to, to start up an environment uh, where you can play around with it. So you do have to be logged in to do this. You can view the project. This project's a public one, so you can view it um, even if you're not logged in. Uh, but in order to start up an environment, we do require that, that you're logged in. Um, but it's going to take a second and then fire it up. And while, while that's happening, um, I'm going to show you some other stuff that's in here. So not only um, can I view the outputs, I can also ask Renku to show me uh, the graph of how these, these files were all produced. Uh, OK, let me go take a look at a more interesting one. So over here, I'm looking at how uh, this countflights.ran notebook was produced. I see, like, if I, fo I can follow the chain from here. So um, it's the output of an update command, uh, which took a notebook as an input and a uh, filtered CSV um, as another input, which itself is the output of an update command that took the original uh, file of all the, uh, all the flights and uh, the notebook that filters them here. So this is, this is an example using notebooks. Um, so of course, that could have been Fortran code, or it could have been bash scripts, or anything like that. Um, but because in this project we were working with notebooks, they're notebooks. And so let me see here. Is my server running? So yeah, now I can go and connect um, to this live environment, where I can also uh, play around with uh, the analyses and all of these things. I can actually execute this code in here. Um, and uh, explore explore the the, the results um, within an interactive environment myself. I can also make changes. And the other things that we can do with this Renku Lab environment are we can make it um, possible for you to have access to greater resources than you might have on your computer. So Renku Lab, if it's running on infrastructure, for example, GPUs or whatever, um, we can make those available to you. Uh, it's possible to get TensorFlow set up and all those other things in there um, so that you don't need to, to do the tedious work of setting that up on your, on your computer, but you can just um, execute it, take advantage of this kind of zero installation environment to, to do your, your data science. So uh, like the Renku solution is really kind of trying to go from end to end, making it possible to work reproducibly locally and share your results with others or work on a server environment where you have access to more resources. Um, so I suggest that we take a, another, another break for a bit. Um, if you're working on your uh, exercise, I'm happy to come around and help you out if anyone's stuck anywhere. Uh, and then uh, when we continue, we'll pick up with uh, Jufei talking about Code Ocean. Or unless, is there any, are there any questions? Actually, I should ask that too. Yeah. OK. Everyone's just trying to keep cool. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, then uh, uh, feel free to continue working on the exercises. We'll take a break, and uh, we'll change gears and look at code issue. So during the break, if you want to participate in hands-on for the next hour for the Code Ocean section, um, I would encourage you to sign up for Code Ocean. Just it will take you 30 seconds to sign up for the account, and and if you don't have the academic account, uh, email us your sign up, uh, message me on Slack, or just come to me. I'll 
personally bump up your, your compute hours so that you can finish the, the exercises without any issue. The default for academic accounts, uh, academic emails are uh, 10 hours of per, per month for free. Uh, the regular one's only one hour. So one hour may not be enough, or may just barely enough for, for the tutorial, but, but 10 hours is definitely more than enough. OK, so can we get back and s get started for the next, um, the next section on, on, on Code Ocean? Um, I know that the room temperature is 80 degrees. <laughs> Uh, anyone is too hot, uh, I mean, I'm really sorry, there's no, not much that they, they did to, uh, to, to change the conditions. Um, if you just step out for like maybe 10 seconds, it'll cool you down a little bit, and <laughs> that's really the only suggestion I have. Um, and who has already, uh, who hasn't signed up at CodeOcean yet for this, uh, this part of the tutorial? Uh, Rest the key up, and so that I will see if we can come and help. I mean, it's... It should be pretty simple. There's nothing to install. Um, and yeah, so earlier that you saw that the whole uh, workflow and the reproducibility designed by Renku was focused on uh, you working, I guess, uh, in installing the, the software so that you can actually work uh, reproducibly um, from end to end, from the beginning to the, of the project to the moment that you want to share with someone else. Um, and if you do not want to manage your own uh, Renku server, for example, and you, but you still have some projects you want to share with people um, potentially over the internet or uh, different time zones, different countries, different teams, uh, CodeOcean is actually designed to be a cloud-native tool. So everything happens in the browser. And we'll show you two examples. Um, one is how you basically uh, look at CodeOcean Compute Capsule, which, which is the project that we, we, uh, we call on the CodeOcean platform, um, how that, that's designed with uh, reproducibility um, concepts and how that's different from Renku because it's a general purpose um, reproducibility platform. It does not really focus specifically on data science, but all sorts of um, scientific domains can benefit from the, this, this design. And the next one is uh, we're, we're going to create what you just created in Renku um, as, a, as a Renku example on CodeOcean. So you'll be ba basically bringing that into CodeOcean yourself. Uh, we'll create that from scratch, and you can see that how um, easy or difficult that process is. And and we have a few other examples if we have time to to discuss and chat. So the format is really if you want to interrupt me, um, you can you know do it any time. I want to be as interactive as possible. I know it's the last hour of the four hour tutorial, so people may be falling asleep or whatever. I'm not gonna blame you if you feel too tired or anything. You can stand up. Um, like a walk around or something and uh, get some water. And it, I'm totally fine if you come in and out uh, for the next hour. Okay, so codeagent.com, basically it's, it's the, the platform itself and you, you can sign up over there. Um, well, we are trying to just Im imagine a scenario where uh, you share any kind of analysis that you've done locally on your computer or within your lab, and you wanted to bring it out to the world to, let's say, a reviewer if you want to submit to a journal or something like that. And how easy is it to recreate the computational environment that someone created in their own lab? Who has tried to cre recreate um, a paper just by installing the software? Who has tried to recreate the computational environment of someone else's paper? Um, raise up your hand, please. And anyone found that it's easy to do? No, not easy, not easy. Right, and, and you know, with today's technology, like uh, containers specifically, uh, that makes it much, much easier than, let's say, 10 years ago. Um, but if you really want to share your work, and the last thing you want to do is to spend a lot of time debugging someone else's computational environment or installing dependencies that give you the error. And um, that's the stuff that we all experience at CodeOcean. And that's, this is really the, uh, the, the idea behind CodeOcean is that scientists should be spending time in looking at the science and statistics and um, analyzing results um, and instead of installing software. So, one, one example that we're, we're going to show so right now, um, if you already signed up um, and you go to CodeOcean, you can actually click on Explore. I'm just going to go back. This has happened too quickly. 
if you click on Explore on the top right, and you will be able to see a bunch of studies that are already published. Uh, so this year, we actually partnered with uh, quite a few journals, a few nature journals, machine intelligence, I think methods, and a bunch of other things. Um, IEEE as well, um, being um, an experiment uh, to, to look at the review process. So if you imagine you're the reviewer, that you have to look at someone else's results or the, the submission, uh, you need to look at, you need to be able to cre recreate what they um, claim if they found in, in their results. Um, and that process is the same thing as, you know, you find an already published paper, and sometimes it's more uh, difficult and more error-prone. And in this process, what, what you see here, for example, if we just take a look at uh, one of the top, uh, the early examples here, um, it, so this whole view, can everyone see? Is it too small, or should I make it? It's, it's too small, okay. How is it, is it getting better? Good? Okay. Yeah, so um, this is basically what we call a compute capsule. Um, and you can see that there are three views on the left and the right and middle and the, and the right. Now, the, on the left hand side is really like um, uh, your uh, folder structure um, in your operating system. Um, it, this is basically the first. Uh, design an um, aspect of the reproducibility we call the organization, where you kind of put your files that are um, um, logically meaningfully uh, logically meaningful together um, in the same folder. So code files uh, consists of all the code files with uh, scripts or any kind of notebook or anything that to do with code, um, and your data files a data folder will contain the data files, and then. Um, when you run the analysis, the results are shown in the results on the right-hand side, and and the middle part of, of this whole view is basically a viewer or editor, um, and so this uh, this on the top left you see that there is a, a blue little ribbon that says published. So that means that this is a in the public domain. Um, you do not need to, a CodeOcean account to take a look at it. This is basically like GitHub. You can look at the code. Um, and, and you, you cannot edit, and you cannot run the code, but without an account, um, if you, you can try that with the incognito mode, just copy and paste exactly the same URL, you'll be able to look at exactly everything. And you also can um, export the entire uh, compute capsule, and also without an account. So this is basically not adding any barrier to um, access to, to the scientific content. And, and when you export it, you can try that, then you will be able to um, get a bunch of folders that includes the code, the, um, I can show you one example here. Yeah, it will have the code and environment and metadata, and if there is data, the data will be there as well. And the environment folder, um, it has the Docker file that's basically constructed by CodeOcean, and we'll look at how we construct the Docker file for you. If you're not familiar with Docker, here there is a graphic user, user interface for you to manually add things, or you can copy from someone else's modified Docker file. And the point is that we do not need to be um, knowing all sorts of reproducibility tools to be able to make your project reproducible. Um, any questions so far? Yes? What's the timeline uh, for these? Do people, do the scientists put up their, their data on ProDotion right after they publish in their paper, or do they upload it before they get approved or published to their papers? Well? Yeah, thank you. So the question is, what's the, what does the timeline look like? Do, do scientists publish their um, their projects after they develop their code and then they, they publish it on CodeOcean, or they work with CodeOcean from the very beginning of the project and then they even publish naturally. Once it's done, you, you submit it. I've, I've seen a spectrum of how people deal with um, uh, the, the platform and 
And traditionally, I think a couple of years ago, uh, Code Ocean was designed primarily as a publication platform where most of the people uh, come to the website only at the stage of publication. So you you do a lot of the work exploratory, like what uh, Shakar showed. You know, it, with your normal data science uh, workflow, you do a lot of exploratory stuff, changing things back and forth, and then when you want to polish it and share with the world, then you kind of redo everything and then bring it up to, to, to Code Ocean. Now, um, because we're a young company as a startup, we, we are basically listening and integrating all the feedback constantly. So uh, right now, the platform is actually designed into uh, a new direction where we are trying to encourage people to work with your project from as early on as possible. It would make it easier to share um, once you already get the workflow going. Um, and the main feature would be um, uh, version control is already built in in Code Ocean. So Docker it was the, the primary uh, technology we used to make things reproducible, but version control is now built in so that we'll, we'll, we'll see an example with, with um, uh, the Ranku uh, repository that we can actually bring it from GitHub directly into Code Ocean or anything that you already developed on GitHub that you can seamlessly imported into Code Ocean, and all your git commit history and everything will be kept um, locally as well. You can, you can sync it locally with GitHub and Code Ocean. So I, yeah, it's, it's getting a lot more flexible in, in, in a sense. And so if you want to, so consider this as if you see anything that's on Code Ocean that's already published, or even if it's not published, you, you can um, create it in a private mode. Uh, all what you're doing basically um, is that it, it's a code and data sitting on a platform that can be executed. So uh, GitHub and a lot of things, it's, it's a revolutionary in terms of hosting the, uh, the code and data. But if, um, if, you, if, you, if you look at what, what's been shared on, on GitHub, it's not 100% that you can guarantee that the stuff is run or, or the results are guaranteed to be the same. Um, we're not going to, like, scientists will look at results and say, okay, it's not interesting to, to look at code and data developed by someone else and to get exactly the same results because, yeah, we ex expect the code and, and data should generate that results. And what's more interesting in science is, uh, can I swap in my own data with your method? Right, and, it, and take it a step further, can I swap in my data, modify your code, and re-implement re your algorithm can still give me consistent results on something that you have never seen. And if that's something that we can do easily, then it will save people's time and you know, it makes the field move faster and um, more forward. So it'll be, th that's, that's our goal. Um, okay, so the repository that we're going to look at uh, with the Renku is, I make it short. If you can type it in, um, it's bit.ly bit dot. It's this one. Bit.ly slash ranku dash co. I'll make it really big. So this is the first link that you want to open up. And this is actually the GitHub tutorial, uh, the GitHub repo that I forked from, from Shakar earlier. Um, it's pretty much the same thing as what you saw earlier, except the Docker file has been modified. And I'll, I'll explain you why I modify them. Uh, it will be much easier for you to import it into Code Ocean. So that's one thing. And another link that you want to open is um, bit.ly slash scipy dash capsule. So that is the um, Ranku example capsule that we uh, we created, um, and earlier there are a few people with um, the various issues with their installation or their operating system, and and they they get to see this example earlier um, where you do not need to install any of the things. You just want to see how Ranku works in an environment that is already pre-configured for you. So that was our experiment as a as a backup plan. But now you get to see the, the example, and you can, you can, we'll show you how to make copies of it and modify it and, and remix it yourself. OK, so if, if you all open these two links and green sticky, so I know that we don't have to walk around and wait, and we can move on to the next step. OK, cool. 
cool. Pretty much all. All right, so the GitHub repository looks like this. Pretty standard, just like today's tutorial. Um, and the Renku tutorial looks like, uh, Renku capsule looks like this one. Um, so the Renku one is for you to take a look at how it, it looks like and how it's constructed and this is the end result of our next exercise. We basically want to create this thing from scratch and you want to be able to compare what you created and how is that different from the one we, uh, we created earlier. Now, uh, I would encourage you to go to capsule of the Renku example um, in CodeOcean and click on duplicate. So this will make a copy for yourself. Um, and this basically, you can consider that as a, as a method to fork it to your own repository. So it will take up some storage space, um, and then you will, you'll be able to run the code yourself as opposed to just look at it um, because you wouldn't be able to directly edit. And I guess once you're done with uh, duplicating, so after I click on duplicate, it will take a few seconds. And it will show you a copy of SciPy 2019 uh, with Renku. And then the little label will show you that it's a private. That means that it's only accessible to you or people that you specified you want to collaborate with. Um, and once you're done with that, and I'll see a green sticky, I guess uh, people who haven't put it down, they can leave it up there. Um, and if you have difficulties diff uh, copying this or with any of the previous steps, then red stickies and we'll come and help you. Okay, cool. So this part should be pretty straightforward. Um, the next thing is, we'll take, take a look at the structure of the compute capsule. Now, the, the concepts here, we're using CodeOcean as an example, but really we do not want people to be kind of um, locked into any particular platform or any kind of tool. And the concepts are kind of universal in the reproducibility space, uh, not necessarily uh, specific to data science, but reproducibility in general. So earlier I mentioned that the organization aspect of that you put your code and your data into respective folders so that you, when you share your project with other people, it's it, logically it's intuitive for people to understand what's going on. Um, the organization aspect. Now, there is an important one, it's called documentation, where it, we, we don't have to you know, go too, too much in detail, but intuitively, uh, you want to be able to have a readme file that explains what's going on within the project and the structure of the project, ideally. Um, but usually, readme, having a, a readme is better than having no readme, but there's al always ways to improve your readme file. Um, and ideally, you want to also include what what the code file does to the file, uh, to the to the data file, and how the data file is collected, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but what's important is something about the computational environment. So earlier, um, Shekhar mentioned that a few ways you can document your um, computational environment with uh, the YAML file from Conda, your Docker file, and your uh, requirements.txt all for Python, right? And CodeOcean is not specific to Python. Again, Renku is not specific to Python in, in any way I, either. But I am just wanted to show you that um, for, for environments, um, we do have a graphic user interface for you to configure any of the prerequisites or the, the dependencies um, so that you can, uh, you can configure them either through a Docker file, which we'll take a look at here. If you click on the Docker file under environment, then you will see that it's a pretty standard Docker file that installs different packages. Um, and if you're familiar with how to construct that, then that's, that's totally you know, possible to do if you, if you write that file yourself. Now, if you're, if you're not um, familiar with that, or if you don't really want to learn Docker, then there's another option that you can actually click on the, each of these um, 
uh, package managers. So apt-get for your Linux system um, and pip or conda for uh, the packages that you want to install. And you can see that there's a little blue add button where when you click on add, uh, just for example, I'm, I'm not going to really write anything. You can type the name of the, the package. So if we say pandas, I'm pretty sure I already have pandas installed. And if you don't specify the version and you click on check mark OK, then it's going to uh, bring in the latest version of pandas and at the level, at the stage of installation. Now that's important because you do not want the version, the update to the package to impact any of the study that you publish or shared with other people. So this happens only once at the installation level. So before you create any compute capsule or any kind of computational environment, I really would recommend two things. One is to make sure that all your software is installed and and sealed, you do not really update that later on. If you update it, then you update the entire project. So you do not let people um, uh, grab your files and then you know install everything, but the you know the versions are unspecified or whatever or latest or something like that. Uh, that that it can actually change some of your uh, the results. Um, and the, another thing is about your data files, which we'll get to in a second, is that external sources of data. Um, according to our experience, it's not always reliable. So if you have a data, a link URL somewhere that you say, okay, the first step, if you want, before your analysis, let's download some data. Well, often, more often than not, that the link will be broken after a few years. And if you have that link, that's like a recipe for disaster that you cannot really bypass once it doesn't work. So what we conf configure right now, and also Shekhar mentioned earlier, is that you want to use a data repository uh, Code Ocean itself is a data repository as well, uh, because the data here is is a is a loc it, it's a drive that's stored on a cloud drive. So whatever that you download here will be will be together with your code in the compute capsule. So once you download it, also at the stage of a configuration of that capsule, then you do not have to. Um, re-download the data, or if anything happens to the data externally, here the data will stay, because that's what you downloaded. It's like the software that you installed. OK, so I will just stop. Any questions so far regarding the compute capsule? OK, pretty good. All right, so let's try. So there are two ways to create a Code Ocean capsule. The first one is you create from scratch. So if you have a local drive, you can copy and upload the files. Um, that's probably a very common way for many people. Now, I will go get back to that step. Um, just for one reason is I'm kind of worried about the, the Wi-Fi if everyone is trying to upload stuff. And I looked at the size of this repo. It's kind of like 30 megabytes or something like that. Uh, it may not really uh, be smooth. Uh, and I, I, we don't want to waste any time on that. So the next is much easier is that instead of using the Wi-Fi to upload it, we'll do cloud-to-cloud -cloud transfers. Basically, we will use the uh, GitHub repository that I shared earlier. We'll import this one directly into CodeOcean so that we, don't, we bypass the Wi-Fi here. We don't have to worry about whether the connection is good or not. So let's go to the second step first. Um, let's, let's click on... Um, Let's go to Code Ocean directly, so we'll see how we create a capsule. So let's go to just CodeOcean.com, um, and and we go to go to dashboard. Now, if you haven't really, if you made a a, a copy of the previous capsule that I shared with you, you will see all capsules uh, with one example. It should be only seeing one. Uh, and if you copy a lot of them, like what I have, then you have multiple. Now, on, t on the top, there is a new capsule. That's how you want to get started. And you click on that, you have two options, create blank capsule. And the second one is import git repository. Now we choose the second option, import uh, git repository. You click on that one. And then it asks you to 
supply the URL of the Git repository. So in this case, we are going to copy and paste from the Git repository that I shared earlier. So if you don't remember, it's the bit.ly link, uh, bit.ly slash ranku-co. So that is, you have to go to this website first uh, because bit.ly will not be uh, importing the, the repository for you. So you'll be able to see this uh, GitHub repo format. And then you go to, go back to CodeOcean and then copy and paste that repository, the URL into the, the window. And then you click on import. And once you're done, uh, I'd like to see a green sticky so that I know that you have no issue with importing it to CodeOcean. And yeah, if you have questions or you've experienced anything, it should take no more than five seconds. And then Red Sticky then will come and help you. Okay, I, I can, any, anyone has questions for that step, where we should go, where we uh, copy from, where we copy to, et cetera? I think it's a pretty straightforward operation for this, for this part. Okay, cool. So uh, most of you, it seems like you already imported the, the, the capsule. Now, um, just remember the documentation aspect that we, we need to specify what kind of computational environment. Now, before click on anything, you can actually scroll. This is the first thing that you need to do normally when you import um, a capsule, a, a project, or when you create any project. You want to specify the environment, the starter environment. Uh, CodeOcean has a pre-configured environment. Uh, so they're with Python pre-installed, there is also GPU support, um, and Ubuntu Linux without anything else, and, and then R different languages. And for proprietary languages, we do support two of them, uh, MATLAB and Stata. So if you work with engineers or economists, uh, these are the very popular languages um, that kind of, someone mentioned that CodeOcean right now is probably the, the, the easiest place to run MATLAB or Stata code. Uh, just because you need the licenses usually to, to run them either locally to share with other people. Uh, whereas here with your academic sus subscription that you have like 10 hours to kind of play with uh, these, these kind of existing projects on GitHub if you want to import them um, and a bunch of other things. But all open source languages are supported. Now, right now we do not really need to select anything. Normally I would ask you to select Python, um, but I mean, we, we, we can, it's not, a, it's not a problem because we're going to change that very quickly. So let's select Python. Let's click on the Python 3.7. Um, this one is a pre-built image that uh, has Conda installed already. Um, now the, the next thing is, you'll see that there's no package installed and there's nothing configured. And if you click on um, environment, If you click on environment, you see there's a Docker file that's being generated as soon as you click on the environment of, with Python. And, and by the way, you can always change it if you don't like Python anymore and you can switch to R, that's totally fine as well. Um, and all it does is to change the Docker file in the back end. Um, and so that way, when you take a look at the Docker file, for those of you who know Docker, it's actually pulling a pre-built image from the, the CodeOcean open registry. So there's something that's pre-made for you, you download it. Right now there's nothing installed. Um, but what we're trying to do right now is that we don't want to spend any time on installation. So we, we want to grab something that's already been configured for me, like the uh, GitHub repo that I configured for you. So there is a Docker file in the GitHub repo. Remember, it's not a Docker file in environment. It's a Docker file in, in, you import it. And it's also called Docker file, exactly the same name. Um, but this one is under the notebooks folder in your uh, compute capsule. So if you click on that one, it's got a lot more content in it, right? Um, and so this is the file we're going to be using. And how do we use it? You drag and drop into environment. Uh, it's probably the simplest way to do that is, yeah. Uh, you can also upload it. There's some the buttons here and there. But the easiest thing is to drag it. And, and then when you uh, put it above 
uh, environments, it will be highlighted in blue. And you drop it over there, it will ask you uh, the, the file already exists, do you want to replace it? And yes, we do want to replace it. And the file is being replaced. Now, so that doesn't seem to be uh, too bad. Um, I have to say that to create this Docker file, um, it didn't take me too long, uh, not because I'm a, I'm a Docker pro in any way. I do not really write Docker files on a regular basis. But if you look at the environment, if you click on the environment right now, uh, you see that a lot of things were added, right? So originally, when we look at the environment, there was just Python 3.7. There's nothing else. There's no additional packages being installed. But now, all these things were added according to the specification in the Docker file. So uh, earlier, we, we, we mentioned that you can actually add the uh, package, and, and you can add them one by one, which will take a while. Or I took what uh, Shekhar mentioned, uh, the requirement.txt uh, file that's generated from the repository. And I basically copied and pasted the text into the Docker file and then, and then create a Docker file that way. So it's kind of like a semi-hybrid mode. But what, what's important is that you understand that within CodeOcean, if you don't really know how to construct the, the Docker file, you can look at exist, existing files from existing projects, and you can grab their Docker file if you want to see, oh, this project looks similar to mine, or you know, either way, then you can modify a few things, and they can basically, it will work for you. Um, and if you're, of course, a, an expert on creating Docker files, then this will be super easy for you. Um, so, so Dockerfile has been created, but Dockerfile is really just a recipe. It's not really um, doing anything yet unless you run it. Um, the next thing is we wanted to be able to um, create a process where it's consistently reliable uh, to generate the results that you expect. Now, what, what I mean by that is that it's, an, it's an, another aspect, one of the four facets in reproducibility called automation, where you want to create something called a master script, or someone will call it driver script or chef script. Basically, is one file or one script that specifies what you want to run in the entire computational study. And you do not manually select, oh, today I want to run this first, ne the, the next file second. You run one file, that file specifies what gets run first, what gets run last. So it's in the chronological order, uh, well, top-down order normally. Um, so in this case, we actually call that uh, a run file in CodeOcean, but you can call it anything. It's a bash script. Um, and and in uh, here, it's probably not the most uh, commonly uh, used format because we are converting a Jupyter notebook into a rendered HTML. This is what, what this, this file is doing. But I'll show you more examples where typical studies um, uh, have multiple an analysis scripts where you call for these analysis scripts to generate files in your results. And then all you need to do is to call that main driver, uh, master script so that you avoid human intervention in the process of generating any of your results so you can remove that ambiguity in, in that uh, reproducible manner. Uh, so this, by default, the current version of CodeOcean requires your run file to be inside the code folder. So let's, oh, there's a little rendering, huh, there's a little viewing mismatch here. We'll, we'll fix that later, but what we want to, yeah, so it's, it disappeared. So what we want to see is that there's nothing in code. Um, what we want to do is we want to drag the, the run file into code. You can create a file in code by highlighting code and then click on create a blank file. It's up to you how, however you want to create it. But in this case, if you just drag and drop into code, and you will see that the run file has a little green flag next to it. As soon as you drop it into code, it means it's runnable. And the way it's runnable is that on the right-hand side, there is this, this blue little button called reproducible run. So when you click on that one, but don't click on it yet because it will give you an error. Um, this, this button looks for the run file within code folder. 
Um, and if you have suggestions on, oh, is this process is not intuitive or whatever, you know, by all means tell us and we'll, we'll work out something that's more intuitive for most of people. But right now, so far, we've been receiving feedback on this is actually, uh, it's manageable and it's intuitive enough. Um, so this run file is being called as soon as you run reproducible run and the results will be shown on the right hand side. And you can see that as soon as I do any kind of edit, the, this green button will be keep adding. So we added run file, Docker file, we deleted Docker file, and we also edited, we deleted the original uh, run from a different folder. So these are all committable, right? So you can actually commit every single step. And if you have this commit, early commit often philosophy built in your brain, then you know, this is much easier to do, um, although the, this message is pretty bad, but um, in reality, you want to write some meaningful messages so that you know what happened um, in the future. And, but, but the history is there, so you do not, there's no escape from what you have done if you commit often enough. Um, and what's important here is that we still have all the content that's in notebooks. Um, so Renku has the design of tracking data and code within the Renku repository. Now, CodeOcean, originally by design, do separate code and data into different folders because conceptually they are not supposed to be merged together. And we're still working on whether that can be seamlessly integrated. But at this point, I would recommend, you know, this is probably not the most kosher Code Ocean capsule example, but for the sake of getting Renku to run successfully, what we found is that the easiest is to drag the entire notebooks folder into code and, and it will sit inside where you will have all your notebooks and your, your examples and, and everything will be generated within those folders. Um, conceptually, it, it may have some kind of uh, inconsistency with what we mentioned before, data and code being separate, but in this case for Renku's, um, the power to kind of control, version control the, the metadata and also add relationship between your processing steps. I think there's a benefit to be gained uh, by doing this. And we can see other examples where, where you do um, uh, scientific studies or publication. Um, very often people do separate their code and data because they don't know how to use Renku or they don't really have Renku built into their workflow. But, um, but in, in this case, uh, we'll, we'll show an example that right now basically everything that's being configured is uh, you have your, your code, um, we have the, um, the master script that runs three um, notebooks. So in this case, we have this, the, the, the first notebook getting started, second one build pipeline, third one update pipeline. Um, and remember, you did a lot of the interventions in the middle, checking this, changing the airport name, and doing this and that. We, we, we haven't done any of that, right? So this process is not optimized to be end-to-end, -end, like no, no intervention. But we, what we want to really see here is just get you an idea. Okay, so when you finish the entire run of, of your master script, there's something to be generated and something that needs to be uh, pro uh, produced as a result. So also take a look at the commit history. Right now, um, right now for this version of Code Ocean, it's automatically staging. Uh, so we don't have to kind of add all the files as soon as you change anything, it's automatically added, but it's not committed yet. So we have lots of files because I just dragged the entire folder of notebooks into code. Um, I'm going to commit very quickly now, and I'll click on reproducible run, and you will see that right now, if you're clicking on that as well, then I would say uh, put on the green sticky so that it's still running, and I can see that whoever have a sti green sticky on, uh, and if you if you don't plan to run, you can move, remove the green sticky. That's fine too, but if you if it's running, and leave the green sticky on, and I, I want to see that uh, how many people are actually having success with with the with the project. So mine actually finished the the entire thing that finished in 26 seconds. Um, I think there is something that's been cached as the, the build log. Not all of you will run this fast. Okay, so who has, f okay, so who hasn't finished? Can you switch back to the red sticky? So I, I know that um, you're still running, but uh, it's not done yet. 
and I also see a few green sticky. Does that mean that you finished? Okay, so it's, yeah, I, you know, some, some of the experiences are, are extremely fast. Uh, you do have the results, and you, if you take a look at the build log, um, if you have taken a look at any uh, Docker build process, this is basically the standard Docker build process. You're grabbing the images, you're installing all the packages, and there's a lot of stuff to install, but um, the, I guess the Renku installation process is pretty straightforward, uh, and it didn't take that much longer than necessary. And, and then we do have the three rendered HTML. Let's take a look at the, the results. So we're running results. Okay, so, so I got a few errors, and the reason is that um, uh, I think Git was not configured, so none of the results show you the real stuff. So when we render it, first, remember, Shekhar was well, mentioned that, oh, if you have your username specified, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's uh, keep going. But if you don't, then you, know, you want to specify that first. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to init, rank who init your, your repository. So that step, I remember that, OK, so if you want to make that step runnable and not getting all these annoyed um, error message, you can edit this first, very first notebook uh, just as text editor without running it as a Jupyter notebook. Uh, CodeOcean renders it directly in the browser so that you can edit the cell by itself. Uh, all you need to do is to click on the second cell. So I'm going to uncomment these two. And on the right hand side, of course, ask me to, um, to commit the changes. So, Okay, and then I think this is the step that, that's blocking everything um, from running. So we can click on reproducible run again, just by fixing that step. Now, those ones with the uh, red sticky, is the process still running? Okay, so, okay, so like half-half, interesting. <laughs> um, and which stage are you at? Have you passed the building process yet? Oh, this one finished. Have you finished the, the building process? Or still building? Still building, OK. Yeah, so some building processes will take longer. I guess it uh, depends on the back end uh, distribution of the, the machines. But we do use AWS in the back end. Um, this is probably something that we can, we can look at more in detail to, to optimize the experience. So what we have right now is, uh, OK. I may have killed it. I click on it twice. Sorry, I'll, I'll redo that again. So right now, if I click on reproducible run again, it will just go through the exactly same process uh, without building it again, because the first time is the build. And I haven't really changed anything regarding my computational environment. So nothing should be rebuilt. Um, and, but all it will do is to convert notebooks. So this time it's taking significantly longer, because I have the right credentials for my Git. So I'm actually creating the Renku repositories, um, and Renku is doing the work, and it will take time. So it's converting, I guess, the second uh, notebook, and now it's converting the third notebook. Now it's finished. OK, so notice the difference here is that I do not have the build log anymore. So any subsequent runs, if you do not change your computational environment, there's nothing to build. Uh, all your time is spent on analyzing your, your data and your, your results. Um, so for those of you who just finished building the process, what we did, we basically went back to the first notebook. We edited the second cell. We basically uncommented the credentials. It will give you some kind of fake stuff so you can actually go through the, the notebook. Um, and here, I rerun the whole process after I uncommented that. Um, some people notice that I, I committed, but you do not need to commit anything to, to be able to run. It's exactly the same concept as you do that on your local computer. You commit so that you have a good record. But if you don't commit, you can still run the script. So that's the that's same, uh, same idea. Now, if we take a look at the, the latest getting started uh, HTML, so here it works, and you can initialize the empty uh, Renku project. and. And we'll look at the git status. You git add everything um, and create a data set. OK. So all these things that you have experienced in the workshop uh, basically has been uh, done in this one-off, one-run, end-to-end process for the first 
notebook, and then you can take a look at the second notebook. It, it's kind of the same idea where you added files and you want to create, uh, let's scroll down to the process where, yeah, look, so there is this fancy Ranku style um, relationship map that's being rendered based on real data. So this is actually generated based on the results. Um, and we skipped all the, the exercises. So this is a, a one way to run what a, a study or a computational um, project is on Code Ocean is that you specify the master script, then you uh, you tell it to run specific uh, uh, files, either it's a script or a notebook, and and then you specify that in your results, and these are expected to be in your results. Now, if you wanted to do where a lot of people are doing science and you want to do interactively, uh, you want to be able to look at the results and change things back and forth, and that has been. Uh, that's possible to do that in Jupyter, um, or you can do it in the command line if you really want to do something really quick. And, and Jupyter here, if you click on um, Cloud Workstation, uh, and our users, you know, if you choose a different environment, you can also launch our studio. And the Jupyter environment will allow you to run the notebook in, in the browser the same way as you run locally. And the beauty is that, let's say you did the Ranku workshop today and you find, hey, it's actually helpful to my lab mates, but I don't really know if they want to install Ranku or anything to locally on their computer. Um, if you have Ranku servers set up, I mean, good for you. Um, but if, if you don't have that, then this capsule you just created, you can, you can share that with your colleagues. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you in a second how you share that. But the experience they will have is this is exactly the same thing. They will, they will access this uh, compute capsule in their browser, and you can look at your uh, the notebooks, and you can look at exactly what you did today as opposed to uh, getting frustrated to install things first um, or setting environment uh, so that you can get to the actual uh, uh, exercise. So here, I can run it line by line. Uh, here in, in the environment, my, my names are actually set up um, correctly. And then I can, so I open the, the first one, getting started, notebook. Uh, I initiate, initiated the, um, uh, the Ranku project and then look at the files. And this is basically how you run locally on your computer, except this environment is being configured on, online and you do not have to spend any time uh, configuring it. Or if your local computer is super old and super, uh, super weak, you can still access that from a browser if the browser uh, works for you. Uh, so yeah, you can just run it one by one. Basically, you get the idea. And then once you're done, you can save it, and then you can shut it down. And it will ask you whether you wanted to sync back the the, the material, so anything that you edit here will be synced back to the normal Code Ocean view so that uh, it's, it's all, um, so it's kind of like the same experience as what you do locally. Um, but it, it is syncing between two different cloud storage um, uh, sites. There's some messages that are not supposed to be there, but <laughs> sorry, let's just ignore that. I'll, I'll refresh the page. You know, it always happens when you do a tutorial somewhere. Um, some random stuff will, will show up. Uh, it, it could be like scary looking, but I know that it's not because I've tested it before. And um, so any questions so far regarding what we did? Um, basically, we brought the uh, GitHub repository into Code Ocean, and we configured a Docker environment uh, by using a pre-configured Docker file. Um, and, and also we, we specify the run uh, file that is the master script so that you can, you can recreate the process uh, of someone else's study end to end without any intervention. Um, and you also, we look at the ways we uh, explore your analysis interactively using Jupyter. Um, any questions so far regarding all those things we have done? No, we, I see there's a red sticky over there. Okay, good. <laughs> well, so that process took like a really a long time. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so 
so that that's that's one thing. And then th this is basically this is basically a a big bulk of what the code Codotion experience is you you can create so we mentioned that earlier but we want to create uh, capsules from scratch um, now the last thing the last thing of any existing project um, is that you want to share it with the rest of the world you want to be, be able to publish it now the current process is that um, you need to be s so first of all you have to commit any uncommitted changes before you uh, you submit or publish anything. Um, that I think it's a it's a design feature, and then you have to run the reproducible run um, as your last step, so that you you are able to uh, confirm this is the result that you wanted to submit to to the reviewer or to the Code Ocean verification team. And then what happens here is that we're just going to rerun the whole uh, process again and get all the expected results. Now, before you Share your your uh, or before you publish your Code Ocean capsule, uh, there there's a lot of things that are that's missing. For example, if you if we're talking about this project, it's Renku. Okay, well, we will get it. But you know, there's a lot of things that's missing. Who is this project owner? Uh, what are the licenses that you specified? The metadata. Uh, who is the team uh, co-authors, etc. Is there any publication associated with this? Um, on what journal? And so all that kind of stuff. It's in the metadata section where we need to fill them out one by one um, for good documentation, right? So you want to be able to tell your future self and your lab mates and anyone that you want to collaborate with as much detail as possible. So in this, for the example we're doing, we're going to just write as little detail as possible, but you know, don't do this in real life. And then we will fake submit and we'll, I'll show you the process and it will look like you know, the verification team will receive it. So this will be Ranku uh, Code Ocean SciPy tutorial, and I'll save it. And then the capsule name is tutorial. Um, and software license and data license. Um, does anyone use software licenses for all the code that you produce or share with people? Okay. Okay, so fewer than half people. And this is another design aspect of the uh, Code Ocean reproducibility um, philosophy is that the, in, in documentation, the uh, licensing information is important because for open science, you want to choose the licenses. Whatever you specify, it will di dictate how people are going to use it. Um, if you don't specify anything, um, I think different countries have different cultures, but the more, uh, I don't know, the, I, don't, I don't even know the word, the more uh, mature or, uh, uh, I guess, competitive cultures uh, and academically, they will probably just assume that this thing is not really liberal, that you cannot use it uh, in whatever way you want because they don't want to get sued. So that restricts people's access to your code and to your data. So I would suggest always select a license so that you are being deliberate with the choice that you're making for your colleagues in the future. Um, and here, I mean, the most liberal one is probably no rights reserved. Uh, you can... Uh, uh, no, BSD is, 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 uh, it's, not, it's, it's not no rights reserved. I mean, you have to, uh, I don't know what the BSD3 class license, but you, Same as right, it, it's, and you do have, uh, you allow commercialization of the code and it's not a copy, uh, it's not like a GPL where, you know, everything has to be open source or something like that. Uh, GPL is, it's the Linux uh, convention. MIT is what we recommend, BSD is kind of similar. Um, but this one, it, it gives you uh, restrictions that people will, will have to cite you, but they don't really have to, they, can, they have the freedom to remix and they use it in any way, commercial or non-commercial ways. And the data license, um, we tend to rank, recommend using uh, no restrictions on the data sets. Uh, once you choose to be in the open space, uh, it makes sense that you don't really add additional constraints to the usage of your data. Um, and in this case, there's no associated an article. I'll just write Shifei here, Code Ocean, and I'll save. And hopefully, these things will get all saved. Okay, so I have all the. Yeah. Okay. So, so 
because remember when I mentioned that I made changes. So I added licenses and also changed my metadata.yaml, the file that I just filled out. Um, I do not see that publication button anymore, but as soon as I clicked on commit, that you know, it's, it's kind of like a final stage that I, I do not have any additional updates, then I'm able to uh, submit for publication to share with you know, anyone in, in the world. Um, and you can click on what happens once I publish. Oh yeah, this is another rendering issue that we have. Let's see if I, if I can render it differently. No, this, yeah, this is probably not the easiest to, to see. If I, if I zoom out, I, th I believe, yeah, okay. So yeah, there's uh, some kind of CSS things going on. Um, so we, we will manually verify the re reproducibility um, at CodeOcean within the verification team. So this process is to guarantee that what you say that you're going to uh, generate in your results will be generated from your scripts and nothing else. Um, uh, but we do not really check the content of the science. You know, if your stats is wrong, sampling is wrong, everything is wrong, as long as you get some results, we'll let you share whatever glory or shame that you want to share with the rest of the world. But at least that process is transparent. So anyone who sees that in the wide, wide open, they will not have any hesitation to look at the stuff and comment on it because you, you choose to share it. So yeah, definitely want to share the best quality work possible uh, by documenting extensively and also by just making others' life easier. So in this way that we are not going to waste time on verifying, verifying each other's results, but we can get to the more interesting science bit um, and by remixing and reusing the material that we have. Uh, and usually this, this turnaround is within a day or two. And our verification team work on this uh, very, very um, actively. So you will submit from the moment you, you submit to the moment you get uh, your thing is published. It really takes no more than two days on average. And, and once it's submitted, what happens, so I'll show you the example that we have here. Um, this is one of the examples. Uh, once you submit it, when we look at the metadata, it looks very different. Um, of course, this one is actually a published um, paper on IEEE Journal of uh, Oceanic Engineering. Uh, this is an example where you can render the entire paper in Jupyter um, on CodeOcean. And description is all good and everything. But one thing that you'll notice here is that there's a compute capsule DOI that's minted. So remember, Shekhar mentioned earlier is that once you, you generate the DOI, um, it's a unique identifier. And in, in our case, uh, it's generated by, through a, th a third party for us. And so that, um, so this, this is kind of like an, a symbol of, um, uh, I would say, maybe a level of expectation that when you, when you see this DOI, you expect the thing to be there. It's not like a random link on GitHub you can just delete tomorrow. You cannot really delete or modify this thing. You do have, a, we allow people to update your, your studies. So very often you either add more data sets to update your algorithm or update your results or do anything, but, and then that will be appended as different versions on top of the existing your uh, DOI. But the DOI, the body remains the same, so that it tells you it's the same project. So once you publish that, uh, the DOI is, is shared, and this thing can be associated with the paper. So in, in this case, there's a paper that's published by IEEE uh, Journal. Then the capsule and the paper are kind of complementary to each other. Once Someone mentioned that it was a quote that we have internally at CodeOcean is that the scientific scholarship itself is not the paper because the paper is just the advertisement of the scholarship. And the scholarship itself includes everything from the computational environment, the code, and your, your data so that you can create, recreate the results um, um, of, of the original study. Um, but Unfortunately, I think that the trend or the culture in many different fields were that it was only sharing the paper and good luck with you know, recreating the results. But we're trying to um, change that by making uh, the results being 100% reproducible being the default so that we can look at a deeper and more subtle issues in science and engineering. Um, so this is basically what happens after you submit and then after you pop, uh, pass the publication. Uh, and uh, the DOI, and you can share that. Uh, you can embed it 
also in in any kind of HTML pages, so that you can you can share your compute capsule on a blog or on a journal on any website. So it's easier for that's the last aspect of reproducibility called the dissemination is that you want to be able to share the work and share it reliably, consistently. Um, yeah. So so this is about sharing the work. Uh, any question regarding this step? Or anything we have talked about so far? No? OK, so there are, you know, there's, there's still a lot of things that we can talk about. But I know, like, in the interest of time, just to, to wrap up, um, we, so we, ha we saw an example uh, how to create a, a code ocean capsule uh, using the previous examples that we worked on uh, using the, the tool Renku. So right now you understand that you can actually bring the benefit of Renku. Um, you can work it on it locally. You can also you know, configure a code ocean capsule and use Renku within the capsule. You can get the benefit of both. Um, there is, you know, for your own projects, there are multiple ways to either create it from the very, very beginning before you even start thinking about the project, or you can work on something um, for a while before you publish before you try to publish it, uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the, uh, what, what CodeOcean has to offer. It, it probably will reduce the time of review or reduce the time of verifying with other people just because they do not have to spend time installing any of the things that you, you install yourself. Um, and, and we, OK, so there are, yeah, so on the, on the uh, there is the reproducible uh, DS a channel that we have. Also on CodeOcean's uh, latest attempt in bringing the community together, we do have uh, bit.ly. So the bit.ly link, it's a SciPy 2019 community. So this one, I can share it with uh, everyone on Slack. So this is our um, online community that's uh, it's a discourse forum where uh, I created this, this particular group for the SciPy uh, attendees. So we have, uh, I'm going to be here for the entire week. So if you want to talk about uh, reproducibility or anything that's you know, interested in, if you have any interest in that area and you have questions or concerns here and there, and I know there's a lot of things we can, we can discuss and the time is definitely not enough. And let's all kind of like gather over there on, this, um, on the discourse forum. Um, and, and here basically we wanted to, kind of bring people together is that we have enough awareness um, about reproducibility in this room and at, at this conference. And this is a very much of, a, I think it was the beginning where reproducibility, reproducibility will become a norm, where the, 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 the questionable studies will be a past. And that's what our hope is. And all these tools and platforms are coming together to make this possible. But I think having, having a strong online presence and having people discussing it and questioning and perhaps or the criti uh, critiquing you know, the approaches, and it can only make our tools better and, and products better to serve uh, a better uh, experience for scientists to do the work. So that's our goal um, for now. And, and please, uh, you're welcome to, to join us. And we also have um, a, a, a kind of five minute long survey that I'll share the link. Um, if you could fill it out, it would be great to, um, to see your comments and your, your experiences with, with Code Ocean or what, what you actually wish to see and something we do um, not so well uh, at this point. And as I mentioned earlier that we are a very small company, so we reiterate things really quickly. New releases are being done every week. And we really want to make this uh, a better experience for everyone. So um, if you have questions, you know, feel free to Stick around, and we'll be still around here, right? Uh, check our, and then and if not, I mean, uh, yeah. Thanks to stay for for staying for the entire four hours, and I enjoy this process a lot. And I don't know, check our, if you yeah. want to say a few words. I, did, I also just wanted to say thank you for for um, for attending. Sorry about the temperature in here, but um, I hope you still found it interesting, and uh, hopefully have something to take back. And um, by all means, yeah, I'm also here the entire week. Um, if you want to talk about uh, these topics, I'm happy to, to discuss things. Uh, you can also hit us up on Slack. Uh, we'll be available. But thanks a lot. <laughs>